Okay, so the picture is clean if you want. Can I start now? No, if you want just to share the screen, we'll start one one of five. Uh, okay, salam, salam alaikum everybody. Uh, today I'll be presenting about the uh, cardiac uh, t uh, tumors. Uh, the cardiac, uh, t uh, cardiac tumors, they are, uh, they are mainly classified into a benign and a malignant. And uh, they are. We have the primary and the secondary. A primary we have a benign and a malignant, and the secondary they are a malignant. Uh, the is uh, the is secondary. Uh, uh, the uh, secondary cardiac tumors are more common than the primary tumors up to 40 folds. Uh, primary tumors of the uh, cardiac uh, primary tumor, they are rare. Uh, they were ranges uh, up to two, uh, up to 0.2 percent. Uh, most uh, primary cardiac tu uh, tumor, they are benign. Uh, and uh, uh, and uh, and uh, and uh, and these tumor they uh, they might be a uh, life threatening or they might lead to uh, life threatening complications, and they are curable by surgery or most of these tumors. Uh, these are the benign tumors. I have the most uh, the primary benign tumor as. Uh, most common is the omegzoma followed by the uh, by the phlegoma and the and the and the adult and then the pediatric is the rabdu uh, and uh, in case of the malignant uh, tumors we have the uh, the uh, sarcoma uh, and and the most common type of this of the sarcoma is the is the angiosarcoma followed by the rabdu or myosarcoma. Uh, a clinical presentation in cardiac tumors in general they are uh, being categorized into four main and to four main uh, categories. Uh, I have the systemic, embolic, cardiac, and the phenomenon that is secondary to, to metastatic diseases. Uh, the systemic manifestations like uh, like uh, any other tumor with the constitutional uh, symptoms, uh, weight loss, fatigue, fever, chills. Uh, flab wise, we will look at uh, the uh, increase in the WBCs, the polycythemia uh, uh, or uh, anemia, the uh, plate, uh, pl uh, platelet disturbance, uh, thrombocytosis or uh, thrombocytopenia. Uh, uh, 
hypergammaglobinemia and uh, and increasing the inflammatory markers uh, others and uh, uh, other uh, other uh, other immunological uh, products they are released by the tumor itself uh, such uh, such such as the omexoma that uh, releases the interleukin 6 we have the embolic manifestation. Uh, uh, we have from the left side of the heart and the right side of the heart. The, the, the left side of the heart, uh, they will usually cause uh, they they usually cause systemic uh, systemic embolism, and we have the right side the tumors uh, that might get the right to left sh uh, sh shunt in case of the foramen oval. Uh, it might go to the brain uh, to involve the both uh, 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 hemispheres and to uh, multiple regions uh, that are seen up to a 40 percent. Uh, I have the uh, transient ischemic attack, uh, or or uh, or uh, it might lead to a coronary artery or myocardial infarction, and the lymph or visceral ischemia. And we got the or, or right side; it will travel to the lung to cause the pulmonary embolism. Uh, and uh, 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 how can we uh, differentiate in case of uh, in case of pulmonary embolism? If whether uh, if it was a thrombus or uh, it was a mass, uh, through the uh, echocardiography, uh, we assess the echogenicity of the mass uh, of the mass itself uh, and uh, the presence of uh, calcification. Uh, we can assess the vascularity through the Doppler flow, and 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 through strain uh, strain um, imaging also got the potential. Uh, I I do got also got the potential to identify the non the non contractile nature of of the mass. And we have the cardiac manifestation. Uh, it usually causes the direct mechanical uh, interface uh, inter interference with the uh, myocardial or the valvular function. Uh, uh, there might be an interruption of the coronary uh, flow, uh, and uh, and uh, it might interrupt the uh, the electrical of his. Uh, the uh, the electrophysi uh, the electrophysiology of the heart as well as well uh, add the uh, pericardial fluid uh, accumulation and as I pre uh, presented earlier these are the uh, most common uh, type of benign cardiac uh, tumors. Uh, First of all, the myxoma is the most common of of all of benign cardiac in the adult, and uh, and uh, it is about fifteen percent in the uh, in the children. Uh, it is usually sporadic in uh, in eighty percent of the patients. Uh, they are not associated with the with uh, with any other uh, uh, con and uh, it got the low uh, recurrence uh, rate. Uh, Five percent of max of myxoma patients show a familial pattern of the tumor development based on the autosomal dominant. And all the familial and the twenty percent of those who with the sporadic myxoma, they got the abnormal DNA genotype. I, they they usually uh, uh, present the uh, young and were multi centric with the increase uh, the recurrence uh, the over, over eight. This is the um, like soma.
art. Uh, we have the uh, association of the uh, current complex. It is a protein kinase uh, a uh, what regular uh, regularity sub uh, sub unit. Uh, it is a uh, it is uh, autosomal X linked. Uh, it it can manifest or manifest as a uh, cutaneous or pigment. Station, cardiac myxoma, uh, hypercortilosism, and uh, and a primary or pigmented nodular uh, adenocortical disease. At real myxoma, they usually arise from the intraatrial septum at the border of the fossa ovalis, but can or originate anywhere within the within the uh, atrium, including the appendage. There we usually uh, uh, round or uh, or oval in shape. They are smooth or or lobulated or polypoid compact, and they might be opetunculated. Uh, they are mobile, but were less likely to uh, to fragment spontaneously. Or, uh, uh, upon the microscope, they are composed of a polygonal shaped cell and and capillary uh, channels within an uh, uh, acid mucopolysaccharide matrix. Uh, the, the base of the tumor contains a large uh, artery with veins that is connected with the subendocardium. Uh, there is a presence of uh, hematopoietic tissue and uh, bone. Uh, Mexoma can uh, develop after a cardiac trauma. Uh, such as an uh, ISD uh, or, 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 or repair, a trans, uh, transeptal puncture for percutaneous dilatation of the mitral valve. Uh, uh, the um, myxoma, uh, it might cause an obstruction that leads to congestive uh, uh, Heart failure in uh, sixty-seven percent of the patient. Uh, Twenty-nine signs of uh, of uh, immobilization. Uh, Nineteen percent of patients they got the constitutional symptoms. Seventeen with weight loss or fatigue. Uh, five percent with immunological manifestations such as the weakness or joint pain. And uh, they might lead to uh, arrhythmia or infection, but with these uh, symptoms are less likely. Uh, the the diagnosis of the uh, uh, in, uh, in the chest X-ray, uh, there will be the cardiomegaly, individual cardiac ch uh, chamber enlargement, and pulmonary venous con. Uh, con Question: uh, More specific features, but uh, they are rare. Uh, is it is uh, the density within the cardiac salute that is caused by the calcification of the tumor? Uh, in case of the right-sided myxomas, uh, there is a non-specific finding upon the uh, ICG, such uh, such as an uh, Axis deviation, chamber enlargement, or a bundle uh, branch blocks. Uh, across uh, the uh, ICO, uh, it is a it is a uh, hundred percent sensitivity with the two dimensional uh, ICO. It is uh, the most we use for test employed for the. Uh, diagnosis as well as the evaluation of the um, myxoma. Uh, but uh, the transesophageal uh, echo, they uh, provide the best information for the size, the location, attachment, and the, um, and the um, mobility. 
of the tumor. Uh, coronary and you and and geography in case of myxoma are performed uh, for the people who are more than the age of 40 years old uh, to rule out any significant coronary uh, disease. Uh, uh, the most useful imaging in these uh, of the of the tumor is the CT uh, because it's uh, capable to uh, demonstrate any uh, possible invasion and uh, involvement of this surrounding structure. And MRI was employed in the in the diagnosis of uh, myxoma and we may lead a clear picture of the size, shape, and uh, the surface characteristics. Uh, both uh, both imaging, they can detect small tumors that uh, ranges between uh, 0 0.5 up to one uh, centimeter. Uh, and uh, they can uh, provide the uh, information about the tumor itself. Uh, uh, but we are both uh, images, they are not needed for the, in case of arterial or myxoma, uh, if the uh, echocardiogram is adequate. Uh, the, the treatment of myxoma uh, is the surgical resection. It is the uh, only therapeutic option for this patient. Uh, and it should not, uh, and this surgery should not be delayed because of the death of the uh, obstruction to the flow, or in case of uh, of immobilization that may uh, occur up to eight percent of the patient. Uh, it's worth to mention that we need to uh, minimize the uh, handling of the heart to avoid to avoid the. Uh, fragmentation of the tumor. The second tumor is, uh, is the lipoma. Uh, the lipoma it can be divided into two or more major uh, group. Uh, the division is based on the in uh, the uh, upon the encapsulation. We have the lipoma and the lipomatous uh, uh, hypertrophy of the atrial septum. And it is a sporadic uh, with uh, with I call it this, uh, with distribution uh, among male and female. Uh, they are incidental finding. Uh, they can, uh, they can, uh, they can occur at any ventricle or uh, or uh, or atrial surface. So more, most commonly in the sub epicardial and sub endocardial locations. Uh, the well, the well, uh, lipomas. We have the sub endocardial and sub epicardial and the intramyocardial, as I mentioned. We have the subendocardial lipomas. They are uh, uh, with a, uh, a prominent uh, intracavitary component uh, that might lead to the symptoms of uh, heart failure. The subepicardial, they are uh, asymptomatic, uh, but uh, but they are a huge in size that might cause the compression symptoms to the heart uh, that might lead to a pericardial uh, effusion. And the last step is the intramyocardial lipoma that may, that may interfere with the electrical uh, physiology of the, of the heart. Uh, uh, Transesophageal uh, echo followed by the CT uh, is, the, is the modality of choice to uh, to diagnose uh, lipomas. Uh, 
as they display a low attenuation signal similar to the subcutaneous or the mediastinal fat. Uh, the sizes of the flypomas they range from one up to up to eight centimeter, and the surgery is indicated in case of of symptomatic flypomas. Uh, the the second type uh, there were usually uh, a massive fatty deposit of the atrial septum. There were none. Uh, there were none encapsulated, unlike the flypomas, with excessive uh, accumulation of the fat in the atrial septum at the level of the fossa ovalis for more than two centimeters thickness. It usually takes place in uh, in uh, elder patient of uh, seventy years of seventy years old and and in case of obese patients, uh, they are uh, asymptomatic, but they can uh, result in uh, arrhythmia. And, and uh, it might lead to a spontaneous cardiac death due to the fatty tissue infiltration into the atrial or myocyte tissue, which will alter the architecture and the function of the uh, of the uh, myocardium or or the uh, myocytes. In a uh, rare occasion, the tumor it might uh, protrude into the right atrium and the superior in a cava and uh, Therefore, the patient will uh, present with the blood flow obstruction symptoms. Uh, CT and the cardiac MRI, they are the more, most useful tests. And, uh, and as uh, they are superior to the uh, echocardiographs because uh, their capability to differentiate between the fat and the connected tissue. Uh, the normal uh, normal atrial septum is well less than one centimeter, but it might reach up to seven centimeter. Uh, surgical management should be to, uh, restricted to uh, to uh, to unstable patients. The Third type is the papillary tumors of the heart valve. Uh, we have the papillary fibroelastomas. Uh, they uh, they uh, most commonly arise from the valvular endocardium. They uh, rep uh, represent 15% uh, of the primary cardiac tumors, and they present uh, in uh, the patients who are above. 60 years old with uh, with equal with an equal uh, dis, uh, distribution uh, between the male and the female. The ventricular surface of the semilunar valves and the and and the uh, and the arterial surface of the of the aortic valve. Uh, Characteristics of the flower like appearance with multiple papillary fronts that are attached to the endocardium by a short pedicle. They are usually uh, solitary in 90% of the patient and they are mobile and less than one centimeter in, in the diameter. Uh, but uh, it can be larger, particularly, uh, particularly when they uh, occur in the cardiac. Uh, they are asymptomatic, but uh, but they can present with the systemic immobilization that that were, were result from the attached uh, thrombi, as well as from uh, fragmentation of the papillary fronts. Uh, rarely, uh, patients they will uh, present with the uh, subacute 
endocarditis or PE and this sudden death. Uh, there is a strong association with, uh, with the uh, hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy as well as surgical radiation and uh, trauma. Uh, the treatment of, uh, of, of the papillary fibroelastoma is surgical excision or, uh, or a tumor or a tumor shaving from the valvular wall with uh, with, the, with reconstitution or uh, well, less commonly uh, the valvular replacement. The second part is the cardiac or malignant uh, tumors. Uh, they are extremely rare. Uh, uh, primary Cardiac tumor, uh, they were uh, uh, 95% of, of the malignant tumor, they are the sarcomas, and the 5% of the primary cardiac tumor, they are lymphomas and the mesotheliomas. Uh, secondary cardiac malignancy, they were, they were, they were represent uh, 30 times more common of the lung and the uh, breast cancer. Uh, well, these are the, the distribution of, uh, of the well, malignant uh, tumors. Uh, the first type is the sarcoma. It is the most common well, malignant tumor of the heart. It's more common in well, male. Uh, it is uh, characterized by the or, or, uh, the rapid uh, course of the disease itself, where the downhill course leading to the patient death in weeks, two months, even uh, for, uh, from the time of the uh, presentation for multiple reasons. Uh, the rapid growth of the tumor, the uh, hemodynamic compromise, uh, the invasion to the surrounding structure that will cause a uh, hemorrhagic uh, effusion and uh, or mediastinal syndrome uh, and uh, with distance metastasis. Uh, there are different type of the sarcoma. Uh, the most common uh, type is the angiosarcoma. It's more common found in the right atrium in the male adult patients. And uh, it is characterized with the continuous murmur due to the blood flow. The second most common type of these sarcoma are the rhabdomyosarcoma. They were represent 20% and they are more common in, in, in male. Uh, but uh, it is uh, the most common sarcoma in the children. Uh, uh, I have the fibro and the osseous uh, sarcomas. Uh, commonly, the, uh, the sarcoma involves the right atrium and the pericardium. Uh, they, will, uh, they will result in the right-sided uh, heart failure pericardial disease and vena cave obstruction. Angiosarcoma includes the cap, uh, Kaposi's sarcoma from the infection of the uh, of an uh, herpes virus eight and and in uh, AIDS patients. Phleomyosarcomas, uh, they are malignant. Mesangial tumors with uh, with histologic and uh, and immunophenotic evidence of the smooth muscle differentiation. They 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 usually appear at the uh, at the age of forties, uh, and there is no appearance uh, sex uh, predilection. Uh, they uh, commonly present with the shortness of uh, breath, pericardial effusion, chest pain, um, 
uh, heart failure and the arrhythmia from the from the uh, from the atrium uh, 70 to uh, 80 percent of the valiomyosarcoma they come from the left atrium uh, and they may extend back to the pulmonary trunk uh, the diagnosis of the Waleo myosarcoma are, uh, is, is conducted through the uh, echo, followed by the CT and the cardiac MRI. Uh, since it is a sarcoma, it is a rapid growing tumor uh, with, uh, with, with increased rate of uh, recurrence and with distance metastasis. Uh, it is a considered uh, the poor uh, prognosis with this survival of six months. Uh, have the uh, lymphomas? Uh, they, uh, they were ranges from one point three to two percent of of uh, all the primary cardiac tumors. They are associated with uh, post trans uh, uh, transplant to lymph. Or relative to this order, Hubsen var and uh, and uh, HIV viruses. They were usually uh, present in male, more commonly uh, from 62 to 67 years old. Uh, the common uh, presentation they include the chest pain, pericardial effusion. Palpitation and uh, arrhythmias, uh, non specific in ICG findings. And uh, ICO is the gold standard for the diagnosis, followed by the uh, CT and the cardiac MRI. Uh, they commonly involve the right side of the heart, uh, the, the size of the lymphoma. Uh, it were ranges usually between uh, 3 to 12 uh, centimeter. Uh, treatment of lymphoma and, uh, and early, early implantation of chemotherapy with or without uh, radiotherapy is the mainstay for the treatment of the primary cardiac uh, lymphomas. Uh, cardiac metastasis, it is a 30 to 40 folds more common than the primary tumors and, and were mostly carcinomas and mostly to the uh, pericardium. Uh, they take place uh, in 1 to 20 percent of, it, of uh, all the tumor types. Uh, they will usually come from the malignant to melanoma uh, in uh, 50 to uh, 65 percent and others include the term cells, the tumors, and the leukemia. They they were more uh, they commonly as well uh, come from the breast and the lung cancer. Uh, they almost always occur in the setting of widespread primary disease and. Uh, and, and the cardiac manifestation, it might be the initial presentation of the tumor somewhere else. Uh, this was my presentation. Uh, if there is an, any question or comments. So any question for Dr. Sada? Thank you, Sada, for this presentation. Um, next, we'll have Dr. Mariam. Uh, like uh, after five minutes, she will present. Uh, she will she will do the uh, case discussion as the topic is related to the uh, first lectures, which is the cardiac tumor. So um, be around after five minutes.
Okay, Dr. Maryam, can we start maybe? Yes, of course. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. So, uh, inshallah, today we'll present two more cases. Uh, my presentation is going to be two parts. The first part is going to be cases. And then the second part will be theoretical uh, points that I think um, that I thought that you guys were most probably going to miss, uh, something like about the management of the tumor cases. Okay, so we can present with the first case if we have any volunteer. We will try to um, get a lot of people involved in each case, so it won't be like a heavy load on, some, on one person. Any Any volunteer? Yes, Dr. Maryam, Mohammed Al Abbot. Okay, Fadl Mohammed. Okay, so 43 years old female, asymptomatic. Uh, she applied for a health uh, insurance and she had an incidental finding of abnormal echo. I'll show you the echo now. <laughs> Oh, the echo shows four chambers view. Mm -hmm. And I see a mass that is attached to, to the uh, to the atrial septum from the left atrial side. Okay, so initially excellent description. You describe the chamber, it would be nice if you say this is transesophageal or transthoracic. I know you know, transthoracic echo for chamber view. You identified uh, the mass, which is um, in the left atrium and attached to the septum. Uh, it would be nice if you can just like make a comment on anything you can observe, the ventricular function, any um, abnormality in the valves, anything like in general. Well, it seems that the left ventricle is dilated with reduced uh, function. Okay, I agree with you. Okay, so, so this is as far um, as uh, the information that you have. My first question to you, this patient is in your office, was referred to you as a surgeon. So how would you manage this patient? She had an incident of the of this uh, mass in her left atrium. I would like for us to have an uh, assessment of, of the symptomatology uh, of the patient, whether she is symptomatic or asymptomatic, and was whether only finding as is incidental or due to any uh, symptoms. But I think she was uh, screened and found to have this abnormality, so most likely it is asymptomatic. Correct. And I would like to have uh, knowledge about the comorbidities of the patient, if there is any. Yeah. So she's uh, 35 years old, female, um, healthy, doesn't take any medication. Um, and uh, she has, I think, two babies, um, spontaneous vaginal delivery, normal pregnancy, no other problem. So for this patient, if it, uh, it has to be referred for uh, emergency uh, cardiac surgery for uh, excision of the mass and to be sent to the pathology. Okay. So um, how would you counsel this patient? What are you going to tell her? What do you think the diagnosis is? So most likely, um, as it has been in the atrium and most likely is going to be uh, myxoma. Mm -hmm. Uh, the uh, thing that the myxoma is asymptomatic and incidentally finding uh, being incidentally finding most of the time, I would uh, uh, counsel the patient telling her that uh, you have a mass that is uh, uh, found in your echo uh, that does not uh, transfer to any symptoms to you at the moment. But uh, as we found this mass, it has to be uh, exercised to prevent uh, fu uh, future complication due to the mass, including but not limited to uh, thromboses, uh, dislodgement, and uh, emboli. Okay. So she's asking, 
um, is this something um, malignant? Do you think uh, uh, this is a benign or malignant? I, How, yeah. I would reassure her that it is a benign uh, kind of tumor, and that has to be confirmed, uh, confirmed after excision by uh, pathology report. I would uh, like also to reassure her that the success rate of such surgery is uh, very high, exceeding uh, almost 95% of the time, and uh, with a very uh, low uh, risk of complication. Okay. Ahmed, do you have any other differential diagnosis other than, uh, did you say myxoma, most likely? Most likely myxoma. Yeah, do you have any other differential diagnosis? Well, it could be a uh, thrombus. It okay. Could, yeah. Excellent. So how would you differentiate whether this is a thrombus or myxoma? Well, given that uh, the natural history of she's a female with a history of pregnancy and all of that, this is why I would uh, think of thrombus. But okay. uh, if I show you an echo without giving you any history, it's a spot diagnosis, and I tell you, how can you differentiate whether this is um, a clot or a thrombus versus uh, a tumor? Any uh, idea? May maybe uh, the texture of the mass itself. Uh, the appearance of it uh, uh, could be a differentiating, uh, but I, I really don't have an accurate answer. Anybody want to volunteer? Anybody has an idea how we differentiate clot from a tumor? Okay. Uh, so I would answer this question. So you, Julie, with plain echo or plain CT, you can't differentiate. You need a contrast. If you give a contrast, either you can give a contrast with echo or you can give a contrast with CT. If there is a contrast uh, or a dye enhancement into the mass, that means it be more like, you know, white, uh, that means this is a tumor, whereas it is vascularized. Uh, vascularized and it has picked up the dye. If it's main uh, same, the same uh, echogenicity um, before and after the contract, that means it's most likely a tumor. Uh, yes, a tumor. Uh, sorry, a clot. Okay, so if there is an enhancement, is a tumor. If there is no enhancement, is a clot. Uh, the other things that it will most likely, you know, give you a hint whether this is, let's say you did echo and you don't have, you haven't requested a contrast, the appearance of this mass where it's pedunculated from the septum and it is well formed, it will give you a clue that it's most likely a tumor. Whereas the thrombus usually is freely mobile in the, it's gonna be in the left atrium or anywhere. It's gonna be free mobile, just like bouncing around in the, in the chamber, okay? Here you see it's attached <clears throat> to the septum. So it's coming from an endothelium. The other type of a clot, it's maybe what we call the linear thrombosis. And this is usually formed in a long standing thrombus in patients with severe LV dysfunction where the thrombus, it becomes very linear, like layers around the apex of the ventricle. And again, you would give contrast and see uh, whether there is an enhancement or not, because um, a lot of sarcoma might present with a mass um, you know, invas invading uh, the apex of the left ventricle. Any question? Okay. So do we have another volunteer to complete the case or Mohammed, you're happy to, to continue? Well, volunteer would be a better idea. If there is none, then I will continue. I would also prefer if we have another volunteer so we have a lot of interaction. Anyone? Senior? I will help you guys, so don't worry. It's okay. We're going to go through it. Uh, you know, step by step. And if you don't have, if you don't know the question, I will answer it. So it's fine. I can't just like run the cases without uh, anybody, you know, with me. 
Okay, then I will continue. Okay, but we still have another four cases, so better someone be prepared. Okay, so next next question. Uh, so now we're most likely, we know that uh, it is myxoma, um, it is not clot. So second question is how I would describe your surgical approach. You consented this patient, she agreed. She's um, in the OR, so describe your approach. So uh, actually I have experienced uh, such a patient that we tackle the, uh, the myxoma through robotic right mini axis. Mm -hmm. This is the, the <laughs> biggest disadvantage for you guys. <laughs> you see, you know, typical cases done by atypical approaches. Okay. <laughs> but I Try found, you know, robotic is so convenient. Uh, yeah. for the recovery of the patient. Of course. No, I, no, I don't disagree with this. But it's advanced. Yeah, I mean, it, it, you want to see the regular, you know, approach, the most common approach uh, for the cases before you see the advanced minimally invasive cases. So it would be nice if you have seen an open okay. um, myxoma case before you see robotic. But it's okay. Just try to imagine Fine. how would you do it if it's a yeah. So uh, my axis is going to be a sternotomy. Mm -hmm. And uh, after a sternotomy, uh, I have to uh, cannulate by cava, so pyrovene cava and pyrovene cava. Excellent. And I would uh, pass my uh, arterial cannula through to the aorta. Uh, I would uh, put my cardioplegia. Uh, and then I would uh, snare both uh, IVC and SVC. I would go on bypass and uh, I would choose uh, right uh, atrium, uh, right atriotomy axis through mm -hmm. transeptal excision of the myxoma. Yeah. And after excision of the myxoma, I would close the septal defect. Uh, with uh, a patch. Excellent. Why would you do with a patch? Why not like a primary repair? It's actually, I'm going to resect and remove the base of the tumor with me, and I, that would create uh, a hole. Okay. So this is my second question to you, but you somehow answer it. How would you reduce or prevent, um, not metastasis, but I meant recurrence? Okay, and you actually answer it by excising the, the base of the tumor. So you will excise the whole, um, uh, not the whole, but uh, the whole attachment of the septum. And then it's going to be a big hole. So the only way to uh, repair it is by patch closure. Okay, and try to be very gentle um, taking off the tumor because it's very gelatinous, so it can be ruptured. And if it's ruptured and if it's malignant, it will metastasize. I see. Excuse me. Yes. Yes. For this, as you mentioned, as you mentioned it's uh, very gelatinous and easy to rupture. Why not to go through left atrial? I think it's easier than transeptal yeah. because it's attached to the septum. So we yeah. may throw it. That, that's very, you know, very logic thinking. And when I was in your age, like when I was a resident, when I first gave in a case, I said, I'm going to go uh, through the left atrium. The, so the fault is, and I, I learned it from my, uh, you know, the consultant at that time. He said to do left atrium or Sondra Grove uh, approach, you would need to lift the heart. You have to rotate the heart. You have to do a lot of maneuver. You have to put, you may have to want to put, uh, you know, sponges behind the heart. You may have to lift the SVC and IVC snare. So there is a lot of mobilization um, of the heart. So there is um, risk of um, um, metastasis of the tumor. It's maybe like a, a breakdown into a fragment and uh, get metastasized. So the idea of uh, myxoma, because we're not 100% sure this is benign, um, we want to take it as a one piece. So we'll try uh, to minimize any um, manipulation of the heart as, as much as possible. Okay, thank you. So, okay. I, I, may, I may, if I may add Dr. Mariam. Yeah, sure. If we, you know, if we access from uh, 
the, the left side is going to be very difficult to approach and uh, it carries a lot of risk with it and instead of going from the uh, common right atriotomy. You know, when we do, when we did it, uh, even from the sander guard uh, through uh, while uh, while we did it with the robot, mm -hmm. we we access it through the sander guard. Now mm -hmm. we remove it and it was fine and convenient. But the difficulty that I perceived during the surgery that closing the septum from mm -hmm. the left atrium was a bit challenging and difficult uh, compared to the closing it from the right atriotomy. Yeah, I can imagine. It's, it's a bit far. Yeah, it's true. From the right side, it's just right there in front of you. Uh, so one of the um, technique that you can, what we do usually when we do the myxoma through the right atrium, that you want to come with the knife and make a small incision and then you look and you see because it is not uncommon that, for example, you make your incision with the knife right through the myxoma and then you cut it into half. So you want to go a little bit, you, you will, you know, the echo here, you can see it is most likely coming from the fossa ovalis. So try to um, go a little bit higher, make your uh, C-like incision around the tumor, open with the retractor and look and see. Then once you localize the tumor, you can go ahead um, and you can, um, you make your incision bigger and uh, you know, uh, resect the tumor. So you have to be very careful, make a small incision and look and see, um, instead of just like being very brave and going ahead and that's a, you know, one big, uh, large incision. Okay, so this is the first case. Thank you, Mohammed. Uh, you did very well. I have another case, if anyone is interested to participate. Twenty-seven years old male had a syncope while jogging, otherwise healthy, no medication. Uh, they did, you know, all the syncope workup. I'm not going to ask you what's a syncope workup. Part of it is echo, um, which order, which is I'm going to ask you guys to read it for me. Any? Uh, I would like to participate. Yeah. What's your name? Sorry. Shaykh uh, Shaykh Ahmed Arwan. Okay. So if you can, well, I, I can see a mass, but um, and I think it's in the left uh, atrium. Okay. But I'm not sure. So is it um, trans thoracic or trans vigil? What do you think the echo is? I'll run it again. Uh, I think it's a uh, transesophageal uh, because the RV is uh, directly below. But... So I'll give you a hint. You said you're R1, right? Yes. Okay. So most of the time with the transesophageal echo, you will see, um, you know, uh, the clock here. So, you know, it's at the degree, 90 degrees, zero degree, 180 degrees. So you will know this is one hint here. You don't see it. And in a trans thoracic echo, it's usually upside down. So the atrium down and the ventricle up where in transesophageal is the opposite. You see the heart is um, in the normal position. Okay, so this is a trans thoracic echo for chamber view. Anyway, I'm, I'm really, I want to thank you for, you know, participating and take the courage. And believe me, you will learn a lot rather than just listening, okay? Uh, so you said uh, you see a mass. Where do you see the mass? Well, still, I think it's in the left atrium. Okay. In the left atrium? Yes. Yeah, which is this, the left atrium. And what is the characteristic of the mass? Can you give me a little bit more details? What do you yeah, think is happening? it's mobile and uh, it has irregular uh, borders. Yeah. And I'm not sure if it's attached to the leaflets or in the wall near the leaflets. Yeah, so you're here in the transesophageal, sorry, the uh, parastin along axis of you. Do you see it? Is it attached to the leaflet? Here, see no, you? There, there, the is, there is a gap. Yeah, there is yeah, a gap. Yeah, so the, the leaflet is, is spared. They're just the mass protrude into the right ventricle, sorry, the left ventricle and come back. Okay, and you see here it's attached to? 
to the wall. Yeah, to the septum, right? So it's very attached to the septum and penetrating through the tricuspid valve, sorry, the mitral valve back and forth into uh, the left ventricle. This is the aortic valve, this is the mitral valve, and you see um, uh, the mitral valve is spared, okay? Yes. Okay, excellent. So, as you said, and as you described in previous, like, um, excellent, you caught that that mass was irregular, right? And it's very bulky and going through the tricusp, uh, the mitral valve. So it's not the usual presentation of the myxoma, right? The myxoma usually will have like a neck or what we call it stock. Uh, if you can remember the previous case, see here. So this is the myxoma. And if you can see, it, there, is like, there is a neck or stock, whereas the mass is attached to the septum. So it's... It's a, it's a ball and there is like, a, you know, a thread or something is attached to the septum. This is the typical presentation or the typical appearance of myxoma in the echo. The left atrium, uh, well-rounded, encapsulated with a stalk attached to the septum. However, in this case, as you can see, I don't see any neck or any stalk. The mass is big. Um, as you mentioned, it's um, irregular and um, it's attached to the septum without a uh, stalk, okay? So this is, um, from just looking at the echoes, highly suspicious of? Cardiac tumor, but I'm not sure what's yeah, It's highly suspicious of malignancy, right? Because it is not the typical presentation of the myxoma. The most common yes. tumor presented in the left atrium is myxoma. However, it has to have a specific characteristic that's what we mentioned, for us to be reassured that this is a myxoma and I'm happy to take this patient to the OR without you know, ordering any further investigation. However, if I have any concern about the appearance of the tumor in the left atrium, like this one, bulky, um, irregular borders, um, and uh, uh, so then maybe I can do further imaging to confirm, okay? So they order CT scan for you, and this is the CT scan. This is the left atrium. This is the pulmonary veins. And this is? This is the mass. I'm not sure if this is, there is a filling defect or something. Yeah, exactly. It's a filling defect in the left atrium, which is the mass. It's occupying almost uh, the whole left atrium at this cross section. Okay. So um, I thank you very much for participating. I'd like to have a little bit more resident uh, to um, help me um, navigate through how to organ and manage this patient. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. Your name? Yes, uh, hello? Your name? Abdurrahman Rawili, R6, from al -Bapti. Okay, excellent. Um, okay, Abdurrahman, so you got the idea, right? Yes. Okay, so we did echo. We were highly suspicious of malignancy. We did um, a CT scan, and this is the, uh, the mass in the left atrium. What yes. else do you want to do? So um, I think a TE, for me, I'll start with the chest X-ray, then a, a, an echo. Trans uh, thoracic and a trans and a CT. Okay. Uh, that's that for for me that more than enough. Okay. So what do you want to know in a CT? Okay. So uh, in the CT, I would like to know the size and the size of the of the mass, mm -hmm. and if it's uh, compromising any uh, part of the of the heart of or. or or of the valves, uh, I think these these finally I can see it by the echo. Mm -hmm. uh, then I'll see if there is any metastasis. Excellent. So I'll ask for a pan CT uh, of the whole body, mm -hmm. head, chest, and abdomen, to roll yes. out of any uh, other metastasis, other tumors that doesn't size or not. So you wanna you won't rush this patient to the OR as the previous one, right? That previous one we admitted him or her. And we operated next day. This patient yeah. did a little bit more workup. 
because it's a highly suspicious of malignancy. So I agree yeah. with you. I would do CT, um, set a CT chest, abdo, pelvis, like whole CT, and even CT head to rule out any malignancy. Uh, sorry, metastasis. Yeah. Okay. Um, what else you want to do? Um. So let me tell you. So you, we, we order all what you have asked for. Uh, your CT PET scan uh, came back negative for metastasis. What do you want to do next? Uh, next, I think that that's enough. I'll, I'll take the patient to, mm -hmm. uh, to remove the mass. If, if, okay. if the pan CT came negative. Yes. Uh, that's enough. Excellent. So how would you counsel the patient? What are you going to tell her? Uh, that we already had our workup and it showed that we're having a mass. Mm -hmm. The lift atrium that invading the interatrial septum mm -hmm. uh, and that it's bulging through the mitral valve. That's the cause of the syncope whenever he's trying to do any activity. Yes. And the only management for this case is to remove the mass. Okay, so patient is asking you, is this malignant? Is this something that I should be worried about? Uh, well, actually, I'll, talk, I'll, I'll, I'll inform that we can, we're not sure if it's malignant or not until we take the mass and send it for uh, a, a histopathology. Okay. okay, I agree with you. So, um, but before you take this patient for, or we're going to discuss it later in the theoretical part, but okay. so far, so good. I'll take this patient to the OR, okay? Uh, you did the same approach as Muhammad did, right? Because it's left atrium. You went by cable cannulation. You arrest the heart. You open the right atrium. Is that correct? Yes, yes. Uh, yes. The, the, same, the yeah. same setup by TE, median sternotomy, by cable. And I, I'll, I'll mention that uh, I'm, I'll take a part of the pericardium for a mm -hmm. patch. Yes, to close the atria septum or bovine yes. pericardium, anything, but you have to patch the septum. Okay, okay. excellent. So you sent uh, you sent the mass uh, for histopathology and it came back positive for malignancy. Okay, uh, since that we already had a pan CT and it showed uh, it was negative, mm -hmm. I'll, I'll refer the patient for uh, an oncologist to start. Uh, their workup from their side, uh, if there is any uh, other, uh, anything to do f for this patient, because my job, I think it's done um, uh, after removing of the mask. Okay. Excellent. But I'll mention that uh, I'll, whenever we're taking the mask, we'll take it with a five millimeter uh, land, to, uh, land around the mask. So, yeah, so that would be my question. Like when you initially did the, the case, even if you take, for example, you know, 0.5 centimeter or one centimeter margin, how would you know if this is a negative margin or positive margin? You have to send it for pathology. Yes. So if they tell you uh, all what you have sent is positive. Uh, I'm not, <laughs> I don't think so. No. If, you know, <laughs> if you know in advance that this is a malignant tumor, what mm. you would do in the OR, you will resect, you will send it for a frozen section. Frozen section, and yes. You wait in the OR and they tell you the margin is negative and then you close, right? Yes. In cardiac, most of the cases, when we operate, we don't know whether this is malignant or uh, benign, yeah. right? Even if we have suspicious, we'll try to resect as much as possible. But it's not in our culture that we send for a frozen section. Mm -hmm. However, if you if you if you're really um, suspicious of malignancy, you may want to consider this, in order to save the patient from another visit to the OR. Mm -hmm. Right. So in this yeah. case, you send it. Um, uh, they said all what you have to send is positive margin. Then you would send the patient to the oncologist. They will start chemotherapy for four to six cycles. You will repeat the imaging and you see the response of the chemotherapy to the mass. And once the patient is stable, work, right? And we know this patient will likely um, undergo palliative care. Yes. Right? So that we yeah. do make sure if you have any malignant uh, that, um, and you know, there's no negative margin, keep in mind that you need to follow up on this patient. You will tell the oncologist, please send this patient back to me 
until finish the first course of chemotherapy. Um, and you see the image and you see if there is um, any recurrence or anything, if there's any response to the chemo and then bring him back for negative margin because you do want to prevent recurrence and metastasis, right? Mm, yes. So this is uh, the case. Uh, other approach for this would be, uh, I'll, I'll ask you since you are a senior, do you think if there is any other way you can know whether this is malignant or benign before you operate on this patient? Um, well, uh, I think the uh, the characteristic of the mass yeah. uh, only giving me a hint if it, if it is a benign or a malignant. Right. Because in, in benign or myxoma, usually it, it can be inflated, uh, uh, smooth mass, mm -hmm. uh, um, invading of the left atrium. Uh, this this one is also invading of the left atrium. But uh, I think the characteristic of the tumor is to give me it helped to give a hint if yes. it is benign or a, a malignant. Okay. Do you have any way that you can know for sure if this is a malignant or benign before you operate on this patient? Um, maybe I'll send the biomarkers. Mm, cardiac is very rare. So Take a biopsy, a biopsy from the mass. Excellent. Biopsy. Who said biopsy? Me, <clears throat> Sultan. Okay, so how would you do biopsy? It's mass in the left atrium. I agree with you. Biopsy would be ideal. Not all centers are set up for, um, you know, uh, to be able to do the biopsy. But if you, let's say, you are in the best, you know, the best center in the whole world and you have all the modalities and everything is available. So how would you do the biopsy on the left side? I think as it uh, has a wide uh, attachment to the septum, we can go to the septum. That's a good idea. You can go through the right side heart cath um, and you go through the septum and you take um, a specimen. That's okay. Another option? Another option, I think we can go retrograde femoral to ours, uh, but it will be difficult to award that and yeah. Yeah, the other, the other um, um, you know, option is to do a CT guided biopsy with an interventional cardiologist. Or you can do mini thrombotomy, and you can do and you know just take a biopsy by yourself, just you know. But the CT guided will not be risky for puncturing the left atrium. If you go exactly where and you know where is the mass, and they navigate through the through the septum without you know puncturing, it, it's doable. Again, as I told you, it's not common. And they have to be a highly experienced center to do so. Most of the cases, uh, the surgeon uh, will take the patient to the OR. They will do thoracotomy, mini thoracotomy, and they will take a sample. So if there is any bleeding, they can repair it. The hole, they can fix it without going on bypass, of course. Dr. Mariam, what about cardiac MMR? Uh, cardiac MR will give you information about the invasion of the tumor and stuff, but it won't give you for sure whether this is malignant or uh, benign. Again, it will give you hint whether the mass is invasive, what is the structure invasive to the characteristic of the mass. But the only way to know if this is benign or malignant is histopathology. So you have to send a uh, specimen. But at least just to prevent biopsying it if, uh, in, in cardiac uh, MR. It would show if it is malignant, uh, high activity uh, instead of BNI. Yeah, I mean, you can. Again, it's not 100% informative. It will give you, again, hint whether this is malignant or not, because a lot of myxoma, you know, normal myxoma, they come from uh, with a stalk coming from the septum, uh, well formed, uh, you know, cir like uh, circle um, mass, and you send it and come back positive. So sometimes even the regular uh, or the, you know, the um, typical presentation or shape of tumor, it may come uh, back positive for malignancy. So yes, but not 100%. Uh, we usually, if we have suspicious malignancy, we do every modality, CT, MRI, with PET scan to collect as much as information before we go uh, for 
uh, for surgery. Okay, so I just have a slide here. It's not working. Okay, so sarcoma characteristic. We know the most uh, common um, uh, to malignant, primary malignant tumor in the heart is sarcoma. There is a different um, characteristic of left side sarcoma, which presents in the left atrium of the left ventricle, um, versus the right side sarcoma, which is in the right atrium or right ventricle. So most commonly, it's in the right side. And if they are in the right side, for example, a mass in the left atrium, one of the differential diagnoses will be a regular myxoma. So how can we differentiate um, uh, myxoma from a sarcoma and how can we um, uh, manage it? Left side uh, sarcoma usually present with an onset, like early onset of heart failure symptoms. Um, uh, in contrast, the sarcoma usually usually incidental finding until they, they form any obstructive um, uh, pathway. Okay, left side sarcoma are very solid, are less invasive, so they don't invade the wall of the left atrium or the, uh, for example, the mitral valve. Uh, they metastasize very late. So when you detect the left side sarcoma, usually metastasize it very, very late um, in the course of the left side sarcoma. Uh, usually they don't respond to new adjunct uh, chemotherapy and uh, you may need an open biopsy to confirm uh, the left side sarcoma. The right side sarcoma, as an, um, in contrast, they usually, they have a late onset of heart failure. Uh, uh, they are very bulky and invasive. They metastasize very early and uh, they respond well to new adjuvant chemotherapy. You can do biopsy very easily the right side um, cath. Uh, so what you can learn from this too, if you have a right side or right atrium mass, this is highly suspicious of sarcoma. And usually they are very aggressive. They're invasive, they're bulky, they present with symptoms very late. So the patient may you know, live with it for months or sometimes years without knowing uh, that the patient has any uh, mass in the right side and they metastasize very early. So by the time they are diagnosed, usually uh, they already has uh, metastasis. Um, uh, as opposed to the left side, they're usually less invasive, more benign, not, not, not more benign, but more benign uh, course um, of tumor. Um, they metastasize very late, so sometimes we can control and resect the sarcoma. Uh, both of them, we can uh, do biopsy for them. And for the right side, it's always recommended to start with a new adjunct chemotherapy before we send the patient to the OR because they do respond to chemotherapy. The size will get smaller um, uh, before we do the surgery. For pulmonary artery sarcoma are very rare, but usually they present as a pulmonary impulsive uh, symptoms. Um, usually failure of response to anticoagulation is the, uh, you know, the hint that this is a PA sarcoma. They are less invasive and they are very amenable to resection, okay? Uh, in terms of management of primary malignant cardiac tumor like sarcoma, as we said, if it's in the left side, if there is no metastasis, as uh, Abdurrahman said, he wants CT scan for the whole body to make sure there is no metastasis. If there is no metastasis, then I will assess with uh, the echo, oh, sorry, not with the CT and MRI data to decide whether this is amenable to resection or not. Some of the sarcoma are very invading to the wall of the left atrium, to the, track, to the mitral valve. Sometimes it reach up to the pericardium. Right. So we have to decide whether this is something that we can resect and reconstruct or this is unresectable. If it's resectable, then we can proceed with surgery. And then uh, after histopathology, if it's confirmed it's a malignancy, we um, uh, start chemotherapy. OK, we can also uh, do biopsy first if it's doable, um, although it's very difficult, as we mentioned, and it's rare to be done. Right side sarcoma. Usually they're very aggressive. 
Okay, if they are, if there is no metastasis, and we decided from the CT and MRI that this is uh, this sarcoma is amenable to resection. Usually, we send the patient for a new adjunct chemotherapy first, and then we monitor the mass, and we see usually they respond and they will shrink. And after that, we send the patient for surgery for resection, followed by a definitive chemotherapy. Okay, the a sarcoma is similar to left side. We can proceed uh, to surgery if there is no metastasis and they are amenable to resection. Any question about how you manage a primary malignant cardiac tumor? I have a question for the previous case. As you said, we have a positive margin from the biopsy. Why not just to take the patient for, uh, I mean, re-resection? Because mm -hmm. for me, I think it's, easy to have a redo surgery early uh, post-op than after six months. And the second thing will be even easy, the redo surgery before chemotherapy. Yeah, so I'll tell you. So once we know this is a malignant tumor, okay, and you come to break the bad news to the patient, it's a big deal to the patient, right? So most of them, they will say like, I don't want any surgery, I don't want anything. So we give, we give them an option of uh, going through a chemotherapy and see the response of the chemotherapy. We don't want to expose them to another traumatic OR experience if we like if, if we don't know whether this ma uh, this tumor respond to chemotherapy or not. So some of the patients they will not respond to chemotherapy. Then there is no need for going back and taking negative margin. Okay, again, I just want to emphasize in cardiac tumor, there is no guidelines. It's all consensus. So you may find another surgeon would argue and say, no, I'll take this patient, I'll do the negative margin, and then I'll set them for um, chemotherapy. It's all based on heart team discussion, multidisciplinary team with the surgeon, cardiologist, and the oncologist. But this is the most common um, agreement um, upon the approach of these cases. Okay, but for you as a surgeon, you think the risk would be same for redo after malignancy and later redo than? Yeah. Do you, do you know? Do you know how much the pathologist needs time to tell you whether this is positive or negative? Do you think it's come back in two days? No, usually around a week, one week. And usually take up to one month. Maximum 10 days. No, usually take sometimes up to one month for them to reply back to you. This is this from my experience. I know I don't know if here it's faster, but uh, usually by the time they tell you it's a positive, the patient is at home. Okay. And um, already the risk of redo surgery has like it's, it's one month. If it's within the hospitalization, they called you and told you this is, uh, you know, malignant, uh, then you have the option if you want to take this patient. Again, you have to have the multidisciplinary team. You have to discuss with the cardiologist and the oncologist. By the time you refer this patient to an oncologist and you get an opinion from them, it's very difficult to keep the patient for, you know, one or two weeks extra just um, until you get a consensus about how you manage this patient. Thank you. Okay, so this is just about the, okay, so next case now, case number three, and then we will break uh, for another theoretical part. Who want to participate? It's a very easy case. The most difficult case is your case number two, and Abdurrahman did very well in it. I'll go again, if you don't find anyone mind. Oh, is it Abdurrahman or Sultan? Abdurrahman. Okay. If we have no other uh, participant, then uh, we'll go. Okay. So Abdurrahman, 63-year-old male with a three-month history of shortness of breath. No other comorbidity. He's only having hypertension and hormone therapy, so very mild hypertension. Okay. okay. So they did echo for him, and this is the echo. Huh. This is a long parasternal axis view, and mm -hmm. it showed us that 
attached to the aortic leaflet, to the aortic valve, I mean. So what is it that attach? Uh, a mass and so uh, usually fibroblastoma is the um, the most commonly diagnosed mass that attached to the aortic valve. Okay. Do you have um, another differential diagnosis? Uh, clot. Okay. Uh, um, Well, for now, uh, a fibroplastoma or, or even a clot to uh, usually attach to the aortic uh, valve. Okay. Uh, I'm, uh, I think that is... okay, how would you manage this patient? So before management, I'll go with the usual investigation mm -hmm. uh, with the uh, laboratory and then uh, imaging investigation. Okay, what imaging do you want? Now you have an echo, what else do you want? Okay, so we're having here the transgrassic echo mm -hmm. I'll ask for a transesophageal echo. Okay. Uh, uh, I'll ask for a CT as well. Okay. All right, so transesophageal should the same mass is um, attached to the, uh, to the aortic valve on the ventricular side and um, no other good biventricular function, no other valve abnormality. Uh, CT scan, I don't have it, but anything else? What do you want to know on CT scan? Again, characteristic of the mass? Yeah, again, characteristic of the mass, if there's any metastasis, if there's any uh, compromised parts of the heart or of the valves. Um, as well, I'll do the pan CT for the whole body, just to, to make. Okay, I agree with you. Um, although, if you think about papillary fibroelastoma, it's benign tumor, right? Yes. But you still want to do a whole body CT to rule out metastasis. Yeah, uh, it's something on me. I just like to, 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 to be on the safe side, since there's okay. a mass. Yeah, nobody will fault you, but most of the time, if we are very sure this is a benign, sometimes we don't. For example, an amyxoma like the first case, you can mm. just like, you know go ahead with echo. We don't do CT and to rule out metastasis because we know this is 99% it's myxoma and it is a uh, patient is asymptomatic and incidental finding. So we go only with echo. Anyway, if you want CT, nobody will fault you. A uh, radiologist may call you with the, why you want the CT. Again, you have to explain why you want it, but nobody will fault you for ordering a CT in a patient with a cardiac mass. Um, okay, so how would you uh, counsel the patient? What are you gonna tell him? So um, I'll explain to him that we found a mass to his aortic valve that it may be the cause of his symptoms. Mm -hmm. And uh, the only solution for, uh, or the only management, or the recommended management for the, such a mass is to surgically remove it. Okay, and what do you think he's asking you? Is it something that you should be worried about? Is it, you think it's a cancer? Uh, well, I I'll explain to him that uh, most of the uh, masses that attach the aortic valve, it's a papillary fibro uh, fibroplastoma that uh, is a benign mass and nothing to be worried about. And we'll make sure uh, of everything after we send the, the mass for histopathology. Okay, so describe your approach. So uh, again, I'll start with the uh, TEE. Then uh, median sternotomy. And... Before, before you describe it, he's 63 years old, right? Do you want to do anything I, else? I'll, I'll do a, a coronary angio as well, mm. just to go out if there is any coronary diseases. Okay. Um, carotid uh, uh, Doppler as well. Uh, like any other elderly patient, carotid, coronary angio. Um, yeah, that's it. Okay, Abdurrahman, you did, you sent him for angiogram, uh, sorry, yeah, uh, coronary angio, and while they're doing, injecting the dye into the aortic uh, valve, they showed you, sorry, the, yeah, the aorta and the coronaries, they showed you there is no abnormality in the coronary artery, the patient wake up with a stroke. Hmm. 
So that means uh, it's uh, the mass got implied, uh, uh, impulsed, or uh, causing impulsism struck. Mm -hmm. And this is a. Why do you think that's happened? But while they're injecting the dye, uh, the mass got moved and uh, caused a struck. So um, I'm not sure in such a case when the patient got a struck, uh, shall I take him for an emergency surgery? Or I'll just wait, uh, we will activate the struck code and we will uh, start uh, all of our um, workup, uh, join, uh, ask our colleagues, the neurologists to join us and to evaluate his... Uh, uh, please, يعني, don't hate me, I'm just like complicating the case for no, you. No, 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 but I, I, actually, yeah. I, I, I really like it. Okay, طيب. Uh, now, do you think that you have uh, done anything wrong? And do you think that asking for coronary angiogram is actually the cause of the stroke? Or do you uh, think this is something important yeah, okay. and you have to accept the risk? Yes, yes. So uh, asking for a coronary angiogram, uh, it's not wrong just to roll out of the, if there is any, any coronary lesions. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, it may the cause of stroke, but it's not a wrong decision. It's only a routine workup we're doing for any elderly patient. Mm -hmm. It carry risk, yes, but I, th uh, I, uh, I, I, I think that I already explained the patient the risk of uh, the coronary angio, and he consented it already, and he agreed. So, okay. yes. Do you think Thanks. that you can do any other imaging modality to know about the coronary um, yes. status without putting this patient at risk of embolization? Yes, of course, CT. Yeah, CT and you, right? And you're yeah. sending this patient for CT. So probably you would say, okay, I want CT um, angiogram for the coronary um, to, you know, to reduce the risk of a stroke. Okay, so this is one thing that you keep in mind if you have any okay. mass in the aortic valve, uh, even if the patient, if you want to know anything about the coronary, CT and you is better than uh, coronary and you. Okay. 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 Now, well, I'm not going to take it back. Patient has a stroke now. Where ah, yeah. So, um, as I said, um, we'll uh, ask our uh, neurologist colleague to join us and uh, to do a brain CT or a MRI and to mm -hmm. evaluate his brain. Because in the CT brain, uh, uh, that if the patient, what is the thing is, as a surgeon that you will be more in a cardio and the neurologist will come and tell you it's invading the MCA left and right? I don't know that. What, what's the thing that you want to hear from the neurologist to decide or it's gonna, you know, modify your uh, management? That, um. If it's affecting his uh, uh, normal activity, because the patient, what, why, why we're doing the 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 procedure and why we're taking the patient to the OR to improve his lifestyle. Mm -hmm. but if the patient got a struck and the struck that ruined his uh, neurological system and causing him um, a paraplegia or quadriplegia, and the patient will not benefit from the surgery. So. Uh, there will be no benefit from taking the patient for a surgery while his lifestyle changed. Okay, the neurologist told you he had some, um, you know, paraplegia, um, uh, facial drop, uh, but you know, does that mean that does mean like uh, you don't want to operate? If you would, if you don't operate, um, maybe further embolization will happen and more massive stroke uh, will happen. Um. Is it well, plus? You're done? Uh, uh, I think for me, mm -hmm. I'm not going to operate on the patient since there will be no uh, any, uh, there will be no beneficial on his lifestyle. Uh, so how would you know if there is no beneficial? He may improve. A lot of stroke patients, um, they will improve with anticoagulation or, and then they will, uh, they will go back. I may delay his surgery. I, I may delay his surgery just to do more workup and to evaluate the patient, then I'll do the surgery. If you delay the surgery, you're putting this patient at risk of 
recurrent embolization and further worsening of his neurological function. Mm, yeah. How would, you, how would you argue with me? Um, I'm just uh, comparing such a patient to an endocarditis with a stroke. Yes. Excellent. <laughs> Excellent. Same. So if this patient have infective endocarditis with a stroke, how would you manage him? I'll, I'll just evaluate his uh, yeah. neurological status before uh, taking the patient for a high-risk surgery. Yeah. In, in terms of what? What's the evaluation? What do you want to know from the neurologist to decide whether you're going to operate or you're not going to operate? Well, uh, uh, for, for how much this came taking over the brain and if the patient will uh, benefit from the surgery. Uh, 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 Okay, yeah. so, I'll tell you. so for endocarditis with a stroke um, a guideline. Look for hemorrhagic transformation. Yeah, we want to know whether this is an ischemic stroke or hemorrhagic stroke, right? No. If it's an ischemic stroke and um, <laughs> affecting a small turret, regardless of the patient's symptom, you would suspect this patient will recover. He's only 63 years old. So same as infective endocarditis, you will operate within one week. Mm -hmm. If the ischemic stroke is massive or even small but hemorrhagic, then you would wait for four weeks until the patient recover, and then you will go for surgery because if you operate in a patient with massive stroke, you're increasing the risk of hemorrhagic transformation while you're on bypass. Okay. Okay, or if it's hemorrhagic from the start, then you don't want to put them on bypass because that will increase the, he the hemorrhage further. So same as infective endocarditis, small ischemic within one week, large ischemic or hemorrhagic within four weeks. But okay. usually we operate. We don't put patients down just because they have stroke. We know if we don't operate, they will have another stroke. It will um, you know, keep embolizing. Yes. And this is one of the indication uh, for infective endocarditis if the patient has a stroke or recurrent impoli. Mm. Okay, describe your surgical approach. So um, we'll start with the uh, uh, median sternotomy mm -hmm. uh, in, uh, through a, 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 um, with a, a and bicable cannulation. Mm -hmm. Um, with the anti-grade or anti-grade with retrograde cardioplegia, or, uh, plus clamp is applied, fully at rest. Do you then need we'll a cannulation in this case, or you can go with two-stage single venous? Uh, it's okay. Well, you can take it uh, to a single or a pay cable. Uh, uh, upon uh, the, the uh, there's no difference, actually. Like why would you make your life difficult and try to well, you know, I'll go cable it. if you can go single? I'll, I'll take it for a single, yes. <laughs> okay. And it's <isn't laughs> like, you know, operating an aortic valve, you don't need by cable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, so then you open uh, the aorta. Yeah, you, so uh, open the, uh, I'll do the aortotomy, a transfers yeah. of a stick, mm -hmm. um, uh, just proximal to the ascending aorta, then mm -hmm. exposed aortic valve, inspect the aortic valve. Do you uh, need LV vent or no? Again, what? Do you need LV vent or no need? Yes, uh, uh, I may need an LV vent. Okay, where would you put your LV vent? Um, uh, uh, on, on the left side of the heart. Uh, LV vent? Uh, I, I don't think uh, I may need an LV vent for such a case. Okay, so well, when you open the aorta, the blood is just like filling out and you can't see the mass. Yeah, so yeah, I need that. LV bit, yeah. is completely full of, you know, because you're confusing, right? So, yeah. so you need an LV vent, like any aortic case. Yes, yes. Where yes. would you put your LV vent? Uh, through the pulmonary to... Uh, okay. eight. Right, superior pulmonary vein mm. should be okay. Okay, so there is some surgeon, they don't like to put their LV vent in the right superior pulmonary vein, but instead they said, 
هناني aortic case I will open the aorta and then I will put my drop in sucker through the aortic valve uh, so okay. that, and that's considered to be an LV vent but, you... but, but, yeah. but I'm working on the uh, exactly so in this case if it's a normal aortic valve replacement you may want you may, you may يعني, consider putting just want to avoid it causing a trauma to the tumor. Yeah, so to the tumor and the mass. Okay, so you want to have your LV vent away from uh, the field. Um, you can also put it in the pulmonary artery if you want. It will also yeah. do some venting. Okay, then you open, you're looking at the aortic valve. The mm -hmm. mass is attached to the right and left leaflet. So I'll start looking for, uh, inspect the, the tumor. If it's mm -hmm. easily... Uh, excised without causing uh, a trauma to the leaflet mm -hmm. uh, and I'll be uh, careful when I'm excising the tumor to not cause uh, a trauma to the leaflet or to the coronary sinuses yeah the left on the right okay so you try to shave the tumor off the leaflet but you mm -hmm. need a big hole in in the left coronary sinus coronary cusp yes uh, on the uh, coronary cusp mm -hmm. Uh, I'll try to repair it first, if I'm able to repair it, and I'll, I'll with a patch. Okay, you and try then, it, and then the leaflet is very saggy and like dropping in the left ventricle. Um, so I'll I'll go for a replacement. What type of valve are you gonna use? Uh, how old is the patient again? C three. 63. Mm -hmm. um, I think I'll go for um, a mechanical. Mm -hmm. uh, I, uh, well, actually, I'll go for a, a tissue valve. Because, yeah, because I gave you a patient for the yani, Amr al Muhayra. Yes. You can use <laughs> tissue, you can use mechanical, but you have to have a rationale why you yes. want to. Okay, so what's your what's your rationale? So I'll I'll, take, uh, I'll put a tissue valve. Uh, mm -hmm. My reason why because he came with a tumor on the on the leaflet. He mm -hmm. he did not came with the aortic valve disease. Mm -hmm. So because usually when we're replacing an aortic valve disease with stenosis, it may come again with the same disease if we if we apply a tissue valve. But the patient here he came with a fibro papillary fibroblastoma. To the aortic leaflet. Uh, so yeah, I'll go with the tissue valve. Okay. Any other reason why you would want to go with tissue valve? Because uh, also I want to avoid uh, using an anticoagulant. Excellent. And the patient has a stroke, right? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so you do want the stroke to I be. I just <laughs> remember that it causes stroke. Yes. Okay. So always you have to think again. I will fault you in this case that in counseling the patient, you didn't talk to him about aortic valve replacement. Yes, I told you for right? And he did yeah. not take his consent whether this he wants tissue or mechanical and what's the pros and cons of each of them. We tend to forget in uh, you know in mock exam, but in real life, I'm sure you will remember because it's uh, yeah. part of your consent. Yes. Okay. So, uh, um, and you, you've done, you did the tissue valve and everything. You closed the aorta, came up bypass very easily. And uh, do you want to send the for pathology? Yes. Okay. You send it, it came back, and they told you this is an infective endocarditis. Hmm. Okay. Um... What are you going to do? Um, okay, first of all, I'll I'll, I'll start the endocarditis management. Uh, the uh, first thing I'll do an echo just to evaluate the valve. Mm -hmm. The valve is okay, be discharged fine, no gradient. Uh, then I'll start with the, doing a endocarditis endocarditis workup by sending cultures and blood mm -hmm. cultures. Um, yeah, starting by sending a blood culture. Uh, so I, I, I made يعني, I the case a little bit because you forgot in your management to send for blood culture. Any yes. mass attached to yes. any valve, your differential diagnosis should be an infective endocarditis, and it is more common than uh, fibroelastoma. Mm -hmm. 
right? Yeah. So don't forget the common. Common is common. I know yes. I'm giving you a tumor cases, you know, and you're putting your goggles. This is tumor case. It's a tumor, right? But remember, in real life, it may not be a tumor. Yes, common and is common. Now I know you will never forget this because mm. you've seen it, you've done the case, you forgot about infective endocarditis. So the next time you won't. You see this patient, even if the characteristic of the mass and it's attached to the leaflet and it's bulky and it's big, you know, it's most like, you, like you're swearing this is a, a, like a tumor. It doesn't, you know, hurt if you send for a blood culture. Yes. Totally right? and, then, and then, you know, if it's a blood culture, then maybe he will respond. It's unlikely he's going to respond from antibiotic alone. But at least when you're counseling the patient, you can reassure him, you know, this is not a tumor. It's an infection. We're going to take, mm. a, you know, we're going to remove it and you're going to be fine. Yes, totally agree. Okay. So thank yeah. you, Abdurrahman. So this is the case. I thank just you. want to, know, um, to go through this uh, algorithm with you guys. We're almost done. I'll give you, I'm sorry if I'm taking too long. Uh, so primary cardiac tumor, when you first, um, like, you know, you do imaging or whatever the patient has symptom or not, and you do some sort of imaging and there is a cardiac mass, you want to identify in the imaging, so it can CT out or echo, whether this mass is actually a tumor or non-tumor, like a clot. And we mentioned how by giving a contrast, right? Also, you're gonna look at the characteristic of the mass, if it's freely mobile, it's most likely um, a clot, if it's attached to the tumor and stuff, but also you want to look at all the characteristic of the imaging to differentiate. Now, if it's a clot, then you start anticoagulation, non-surgical management. If it's a tumor, then you would go and see and look in the image. Mm. Is there any suspicious that this tumor is benign or malignant, right? According to the, char uh, the characteristic of the tumor, is it well capsulated? Is it irregular? Is it invasive? Um, is it, um, you know, all the big, like bigger than uh, an abnormal location or unusual location of a tumor? For example, if the mass in the right atrium inside of the left atrium, so it's not, you know, mixed, the typical myxoma. Then you would do further imaging to one, uh, to study more about the mass, like you can do uh, an MRI or CT scan. Plus, you want to rule out metastasis if it's a malignant, if it's highly suspicious of malignant. If it's a benign, then we look and see, well, this is very easy mass. It's resectable. It's not invading um, a viable structure. Then we send this patient for surgery. If it's not resectable, then, and it's benign, uh, we do medical treatment. If it's malignant, okay, in the, with this PET and CT scan and there is no metastasis, we know this is a primary tumor with no metastasis, then we see and we ask ourselves, is it resectable or non-resectable? How would we know? Again, according to how invasive this mass, if it's invading the wall, if it's invading the pericardium, if it's invading a coronary artery, if it's invading, for example, um, uh, coronary sinus and stuff like we think we can't repair it, then we decide this is not resectable. And then we send this patient for no surgery, like palliative or follow-up. If it's resectable, then we look. And now remember it's malignant, right? It's malignant and a primary and it is resectable and no metastasis. Then as I mentioned to you previously, we see is it right side, left side or PA? If it's right side and it's malignant, no metastasis, we start with a new adjunct chemotherapy because most of the right side malignant tumor will respond to uh, chemotherapy before we send this patient for surgery. After that, if he respond, then we send him to surgery. If it's a left, if it's a left side uh, primary malignant tumor, there is no role of a new adjunct chemotherapy. We send this patient for surgery right away if we know if, it, if it's resectable. For the PA, similar to left side surgery right away. No role for a new adjunct chemotherapy. After that, after we do the resection, we'll make sure we have negative margin, and then we send this patient for definitive chemotherapy or radiation, that means referring to oncologist, okay? If the malignant is not primary, but it's secondary, come back to the next. Okay, if it's a secondary cardiac tumor, then we will have to involve, of course, our team evaluation, 
biological treatment, see if the patient is symptomatic or not. And then we will decide. This is a metastasis. Secondary, that means metastasis to the, car, to the heart. So the first question I want to answer, what is the primary tumor? Sometimes the primary tumor in the lungs, sometimes the primary tumor in the gut, sometimes the primary tumor in the brain. So we want to know where is the primary tumor. The second question I want to ask, is the primary tumor is under controlled? If it's under control, then I may consider operating with this patient. If the primary um, uh, tumor is not under control, then this patient go for palliative care. Okay, let's go back. Let's say the primary tumor is in the lung and it has metastasized to the heart. Then I want to ask, does the patient has any other metastasis other than the heart? If he had a lot of other metastases, I mean the heart or uh, for example, the brain or whatever, then I say no. I'm not going to operate on this patient. This patient go for chemotherapy uh, and palliative care. If the primary cardiac, the primary tumor is controlled and the metastasis is only to the heart, there is no other metastasis, then I will assess with the MRI and CT. I will see, is this a resectable tumor or not? If it's resectable, I will send this patient for surgery and resect it, okay? Sometimes in a very, very rare um, cases, um, the tumor may be um, non-resectable, but the patient has, uh, he's very, very symptomatic. So in a rare, rare occasion, we may accept to operate in a secondary metastasis to the heart just to debunk debulk to improve the patient's symptoms so he can live a little bit better, okay? So without uh, taking a negative margin, it's just like to debulk as much as possible, for example, to open an outflow tract or open um, a tricuspid or mitral valve to allow a little bit better, more hemodynamic and better symptom uh, elevation, okay? So this is two approaches you guys have to really have keep it in your mind and whenever whenever you have a case okay how to want to order a ct when not to order a ct if it's a secondary metastasis first you have to study about the primary tumor and see if there is any other metastasis or not and then if the tumor is resectable or not resectable any question about the algorithm Yes, <laughs> so removing an obstructive uh, or hemodynamically disturbance and uh, in, in non-controlled primary yes. tumor is considered as palliation. Correct. Right, and when you go for surgery, you're going to tell the patient it's not curable. You're just going to remove some of the mass, you know, and the mass it's that causing the obstruction, and you leave the rest because it's, uh, it's usually it's non-resectable completely. And usually this patient is in palliative care, but uh, to improve his hemodynamic, for his breathing a little bit, you want to uh, to sometimes consider debulking, uh, debulking surgery. Okay, so McComb, yes. I have a question regarding the previous uh, last case. Yes. Uh, regarding the coronary angio in patient, such a patient or a patient yeah. with infective endocarditis yeah. uh, who has a high risk of uh, coronary uh, artery disease, yes. we still will go with CT first, then we can consider angio, or we can just go for coronary angio as he has a higher risk for coronary artery disease. Yes. So if you have infective endocarditis or like similar case, sending this patient for left side, heart cath, like uh, coronary angio, putting this patient of, of, of high risk of a stroke. So it is not absolute contraindication, but if you have alternative like CT cardiac, CT, a, CT angiogram, it's much better. So this is the usual way that we do. Um, I have never encountered a patient with a stroke in Hina Saudi, but um, during my residency and my fellowship, we never send patients to coronary angio if the patient has infective endocarditis. And if we do, the interventional cardiologists usually they, re they refuse. And think about it, you usually do CT. Now, the, the difference in the kind of patient, if the patient has infective endocarditis, you may not order a CT scan, different than tumor. Tumors already you have a CT scan. So why? You can just add extra CT and you, and you have, you know, the anatomy of the coronary. Um, now, if you have a patient with infective endocarditis, you know, this is an infective endocarditis, and you want to know information 
about the coronary angio, um, then uh, you may want to consider as sending this patient for a CT scan as an extra imaging rather than coronary angio. Victor, what about the LV vent? You will still use the LV vent uh, through the right uh, superior pulmonary vein through the mitral, or yes, you will yes. be more cautious because this mass is in the ventricular side and it's a large mass. I mean, you just put it at the tip on the left atria itself. Usually when we put the LV vent, we don't push it all the way down to curve and you know touch the aortic valve. We put it yeah. in the yeah, pulmonary vein. But like because it's uh, have a section and maybe it will... Uh, yeah, no, usually there is a lot of blood, so it, the risk is very low. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Okay. So I don't want to go um, take a lot of time. So, but um, myxoma with a stroke, as Abdurrahman mentioned, want to operate if it's hemorrhagic within four weeks, if it's not hemorrhagic within one week, exactly as infective endocarditis. Okay, uh, when do you need to do an echo follow up after a myxoma? Anyone? We just want to go very quickly. I have a few questions and then uh, I'm done. Do you know when you want to do, or do you usually? Three to six months. Okay, so any myxoma case you will do three to six uh, months to rule out any recurrence, right? Yes. Do you want, like, if it's negative, do you want to still send the patient for another? Uh, yeah, echo? after one year. Usually, no. Usually, one echo is enough if, the, if it's benign and myxoma is typical myxoma. Only one echo um, three months after or six months after is enough, okay? But when do you want to do it like more frequent? If you have a myxoma in unusual location, if you have a myxo multiple site myxoma, which is highly suspicious for familiar myxoma or uh, Carney syndrome, if you, have, if you have done incomplete resection of the myxoma for whatever reason, let's say it's attached, it's a little bit attached to the, one of the valve and you decided not to do a complete resection, then you want to do further imaging to rule out um, recurrence. If there is, uh, if there is an, any malignant characteristic in the histopathology, okay? So if it's malignant or at unusual location, multiple site, you want to do further imaging. Like after six months, after one year, um, you know, um, until like you're happy, like maybe up to two years and then you're done. If there is no recurrence. Okay. Then indication to operate in a primary malignant tumor. Similar to this case number two. If you have primary malignant tumor, what, what is the indication to operate? Do we operate all the time? Any patient with a primary malignant tumor? Yes. Diagnosis. Yeah, if it's, we have it, let's say the mass in the left atrium, similar to the second case, and it's invasing, invading the pulmonary vein, and it is highly characteristic of malignancy. Um, do we usually operate all the time, or is it there some cases that we say, well... Yeah, uh, in case if it's a clot, you usually just use uh, anticoagulant to dissolve the clot. Yeah, no, if, but, it's, if it's highly characteristic of malignancy. So uh, if, I, okay, okay. So it's primary malignant tumor. So you will end, you will resect if you will you know, send this patient for surgery. If you know from the CT or MRI that this mass is resectable, because some of the mass, they are not resectable, unresectable, okay? They're highly invading a lot of structure, so you can't uh, do complete resection. Two, if there is no metastasis, you have to make sure if this primary cardiac tumor with metastasis, you're not gonna operate, right? Three, if the expected survival or the prognosis of the surgery is more than one year at least. Okay, so this is when to operate in a primary malignant tumor. Always keep in mind, any malignant tumor, two questions. Is it resectable? Is there any metastasis? This is the only two questions you want to think about if you have a, a malignant tumor. Yani, is it in a location that I can access it as a surgeon and I resect it without destroying viable structure or no? Or is there a metastasis or no? Taib, indication of surgery in a secondary malignant tumor. mean, patient, for example, had lung cancer and it metastasized to the heart. When would you operate? Wahid, if the primary tumor is under control. If there is no other metastasis other than the heart, again, if it's resectable, if the life expectancy more than one year. Okay. Contraindication of surgical resection 
any tumor easy. Metastasis, no response to chemotherapy, develop of a new metastasis during the chemotherapy or extensive invasive tumor to a viable structure that it's not amenable to resection, okay? Surgical approach to left side tumor, we mentioned it, if it's in the left atrium, through the right atrium, through the interatrial septum. If it's in the left ventricle, then you see where is exactly the tumor, is it closer to the mitral valve or closer to the, to the aortic valve? Um, if it's closer to the aortic valve, you can do aortotomy and you, you resect it as we resect the fibroelastoma case. Uh, if it's closer to the mitral valve, you may want to do a sonder garve. And if it's away from both valves, you may want to do a ventriculotomy, but this is last option because you know ventriculotomy is associated with left ventricular dysfunction. What do you want to do if the tumor is suspicious for malignancy without metastasis in the CT or PET scan? If at left, if at left side, as we mentioned, we do biopsy through a thoracotomy or mini sternotomy, or you can go ahead with surgery right away. If it's a right side, you can access it through a right side heart cap. Okay, if malignant and histopathology showed um, in histopathology and there is no metastasis, you can start with a new agent chemotherapy for four to six cycle and you do image after um, every other cycle. And then if there is a response, you can operate. Case number four, I'm just going to go very quickly. This is a case, I'm just going to see it because we don't have much time. This is um, a tumor in the right atrium. Sorry, and it's extending all the way to the um, uh, inferior vena cava. So my question to you is, how would you cannulate if the tumor is, is invading the SVC, IVC, and the, and the mass in the right atrium? Quickly, anybody? Peripheral cannulation through jugular. Excellent, so peripheral. Right, you may want to go jugular for the instead of the superior vena cava and femoral instead of the inferior vena cava. Okay. Right, and then you open the right atrium and you expect you have to rule out uh, any PFO because you're not gonna snare. Right, because if you snare, you're gonna cut the tumor. Okay. So you want to make sure there is no sept, there is no ASD or PFO, and then you open the right atrium and you try to retrieve uh, the mass. In some cases, you may, you may need circa rest if the mass is invading very deeply beyond the diaphragm into the IVC, okay? Because there will be a lot of bleeding. Okay. And it's usually involved in a case of uh, renal cell carcinoma, if you have heard about similar case, renal cell carcinoma with metastasis into the in inferior vena cava and the mass sometimes extended all the way to the right atrium. So they, the general surgery will do the um, uh, kidney resection, but then they will send the patient for you uh, to remove the extra part in the right atrium and inferior vena cava. In this case, we know that most of the case that we may want to work with the general surgeon in the same time and uh, bring the cardiopulmonary bypass machine and go for circa rest and allow the general surgeon to try to pull from below the diaphragm. But you, uh, you, your participation as a cardiac surgeon is to put this patient in circa rest, cannulate, you arrest, you, um, you go uh, deep hypothermic circa rest to decrease all the bleeding, uh, bleeding so the general surgeon can um, retract and try to as much as possible from the mass. Usually they can you know, pull it from below the diaphragm. If not, then you would you'd need to uh, open the right atrium and resect it from the top. Okay, last case. Anybody want to tell me what's going on in this e in this echo? Last slide, please. Anyone? Uh, so this is a five chamber view. Um, I'm just showing a, 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 the mass on the. I think it's a, far, yeah. it's a short axis. Uh... A short axis, yes. Short axis. Yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, you, it's showing that the mass on the left atrium. Yes, exactly. So there is a mass here in the left atrium. So I just I just put it because I have this case. I don't know exactly what uh, the presentation of the patient, but I want you guys to be um, you know used to different 
echo uh, views, right? So this is the view. Here's the RVOT. This is the right atrium. Tricuspid valve is opening to the RVOT. This is the pulmonary artery. And this is the left atrium. And here is the mass. Okay. Um, that's it. Thank you very much. You guys have any question? Thank you so much. I'm sorry if it was too long, but I know uh, there is a lot of controversy and confusion about the management of the tumor. So I tried to pull uh, some of the cases uh, for discussion. I hope you guys have learned something. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Noah. You're welcome. Thank you, Dr. Mariam. Uh, we'll have five minutes break and we'll come back for the next lecture.
Our next uh, lecture is going to be about pericardial disease with Dr. Sultan Asghar. Uh, Dr. Sultan, you can share your screen. Okay, uh, you can see my screen? Yes, we can see it. You can start whenever you can. Okay. Assalamu uh, alaikum, everyone. Good afternoon. My name is uh, Sultan Askar from Prince Sultan Cardiac Surgery Center in Al Hassan. Today I'm going to present about uh, pericardial diseases. So, we're going to talk briefly about the anatomy of the pericardium, and then we'll talk about congenital diseases of the pericardium, moving on to pericardial effusion and tamponade, and finally, we're going to talk about uh, pericarditis. So, starting with the anatomy, the pericardium is a uh, fibrocerous sac that encloses the heart and the proximal grade vessels. It is usually regarded as consisting of two layers, the parietal and the visceral. The parietal layer itself consists, consists of the fibrous layer and the serous layer, and the visceral layer is in direct contact to the heart. Uh, the pericardium actually attaches to the sternum and to the central uh, tendon of the diaphragm. Uh, so as you can see here, this is a cross section of the pericardium. You can see this is the fibrous layer, this is the serous layer, and this is the visceral layer. And in between the serous and the visceral is the pericardial space in which the pericardial uh, fluid uh, uh, is. And usually there is anywhere between 10 to 20 milliliters normally in, in the pericardial fluid. The, as you can see here, the serous pericardium and the visceral pericardium are actually in continuity with each other. And their reflections about the proximal great vessels, the, uh, the, uh, the aorta and the SVC and the IVC imperially actually create the sinuses we have two sinuses that are created by the reflections of the pericardium. We have the transverse sinus and the oblique sinus. And these are potential spaces that allow accumulation of fluid in the pericardial sac. And, uh, and uh, yes, they are, they are in close proximity uh, to the aorta, to the, uh, to, and to, to the SVC, and to the IVC. And the IVC actually is intrapericardial which means that during surgery, you can control the uh, IVC from within the pericardium itself. The blood supply of the pericardium arises from the pericardiophrenic arteries, which are branches of the internal thoracic arteries, and also uh, direct feeder arteries from the descending thoracic aorta supply the, the, the pericardium as well. The venous uh, drainage is through the pericardio, pericardiophrenic veins, which are anastomose to the inferior phrenic veins, and, so, and they drain into several veins. Sometimes they drain into the left superior intercostal, the nominate vein, the left internal mammary, the left highest intercostal, or to the thymic veins. Uh, regarding the lymphatic drainage, the parietal pericardium uh, drainage, uh, lymphatic drainage occurs by the anterior and the posterior mediastinal lymph nodes, whereas the visceral pericardial lymphatic drainage occurs by the tracheal and bronchial mediastinal nodes. Uh, regarding nerve supply of the pericardium, it, it receives its sensory supply from the branches of the phrenic nerves. Uh, and the sympathetic innervation, it, uh, it, 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 the pericardium receives it from the dorsal, first dorsal ganglion, stellate ganglion, aortic gang, and aortic cardiac and diaphragmatic plexuses, and the parasympathetic innervation arises from the vagus. But the most important and relevant clinically, of course, is the phrenic nerve, and uh, what you can see here, they are in the poster, posterior lateral position in the pericardium, with the right being more vertical in its core uh, as opposed to the left phrenic nerve. Now, moving on, we'll start talking about uh, diseases of the pericardium, and we'll first talk about congenital absence of the uh, pericardium. Congenital absence of the pericardium is usually not clinically significant. Uh, it is, um, uh, it is uh, usually an incidental finding and has no clinical bearing on the, on the patient. However, partial absence may be present with, with some symptoms, mainly with chest pain. It mostly occurs on the left side, 
and it is thought to be due to premature atrophy of the left cardinal vein. The cardinal vein actually goes on to form the left superior intercostal vein, and sometimes premature atrophy of that vein may lead to partial absence in the left side. Uh, unilateral abscess can be problematic because it may affect the car cardiac mobility and it allows the, uh, theoretically it can allow the heart to be displaced into the pr plural space with uh, incarceration of the left atrial appendage or the left ventricle. So treatment for uh, this condition may involve pericardial resection or replacement with a prosthetic patch. Uh, here is a CT scan. As you can see, this is a patient with congenital absence as compared to the normal uh, uh, patient. Uh, in the patient with congenital absence of, uh, of uh, the pericardium, you can see there is interposition of lung tissue uh, where the pericardium should be. So uh, this is usually, as I said, as uh, an incidental finding. Moving on to pericardial cysts, they are considered to be the second most common medium middle, middle, middle mediastinal masses after lymphomas. They are usually asymptomatic and as an um, asymptomatic, and uh, they are incidental findings in about 75% of patients. 70% of these cysts occur in the right costophrenic angle and 22 in the left. They typically do not communicate with the pericardial sacs, uh, pericardial sac, and their symptoms may include chest pain, dyspnea, cough, and arrhythmias uh, if there is compression and inflammatory involvement of adjacent uh, structures. Contrast CT is usually the modality of uh, choice for diagnosis and monitoring. Uh, percutaneous aspiration can be considered. However, it is, a, it is associated with 30% recurrence after three years. Uh, and surgery is thought to be the most definitive treatment for this uh, condition. Uh, indications for resection may include large size symptoms, patient concern, or if there is suspicion of malignancy. And usually the approach that is uh, chosen for uh, resection of these masses is uh, video-assisted paracoscopy. Uh, this is what it looks like in the CT scan. As you can see, this is a huge pericardial cyst. Uh, and this is how it looks uh, through, uh, in, uh, intraoperatively through uh, a VAT uh, camera port. So moving on now, we'll talk about, we'll talk about pericardial effusion. Uh, pericardial effusion is most commonly caused by infections or autoimmune conditions or malignancies. They can also be caused by uh, inflammation secondary to radiation or uremia in patients with chronic kidney disease. This table lists the different causes of, uh, of uh, pericardial effusion. So there can be idiopathic, they can be infectious. They can be iatrogenic, uh, for example, in cases where pacemaker insertion, uh, PCI or uh, cat catheter procedures, cardiac surgery. They can be due to autoimmune diseases such as rheumatoid arthritis, SLE, systemic sclerosis, post radiation, and so on. The, the hemodynamic uh, conse uh, consequence of pericardial effusion is closely related to the rate of accumulation of fluid, meaning that a small amount that accumulates rapidly may actually have more significant uh, hemodynamic consequences than a large amount that accumulates over a longer period of time. Uh, uh, because the, uh, the pericardial fib fibrous layer is inelastic and abrupt changes in the pericardial volume is not going to be very well ac accommodated. And as we said, small, a relatively small amount of fluid may actually lead to tamponade. In the chronic setting, much larger volumes are uh, usually tolerated before the patient develops any hemodynamic, uh, he becomes hemodynamically unstable. This graph here shows the relationship between rate of accumulation and the time. And as you can see here in patients who's, uh, who, 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 with, with, uh, where the fluid accumulates rapidly, the limit of the pericardial stretch is reached uh, very quickly, and that can lead to critical tamponade. However, patients who have who accumulate large amounts of fluids over a longer period of time uh, have uh, 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 they usually do not develop any clinical significant clinically significant tamponade and, until until after a very large amount of fluid has been accumulated. Uh, this uh, echo pictures show the uh, different stages of uh, pericardial effusions. Uh, it is uh, yani worthy to note that uh, the European Society of uh, Cardiology uh, uh, classify the, uh, the effusions either as small, moderate, or large, depending on the size. So if the size is 10 millimeters 
or less, it is considered a small pericardial effusion. If it is between 10 and 20 millimeters, it is moderate. And if it is uh, more than 20 millimeters, then it is considered as large. And this is a CT scan showing a pericardial effusion that uh, a large, a rather large pericardial effusion. The patient, as you can see, these, the, these asterisks are fluid. And this is an M MRI picture uh, showing a pericardial effusion. Now, my, moving on to tamponade, uh, actually a point to, to, to mention before moving on to tamponade is that uh, fusions usually, if they are insignificant, if they do not cause any symptoms, are usually monitored and not treated. However, if the patient has a chronic fusion and it begins to show signs of early tamponade, then intervention may be necessary with either a pericardial synthesis or a pericardial window. A, now, a tamponade can be caused by uh, the blood, effusions, clots, gas, or even pus. The fluid, as we said, enters the pericardial space rapidly, and it exceeds the pericardial stretch, and the pericardial pressure rises abruptly. Uh, at this point, the only way for the pericardium to accommodate this increased amount of fluid is to uh, compress the cardiac chambers. And since the right heart is, the, is, is, is thinly walled compared to the left ventricle, the, uh, the, right, the right heart is more susceptible to compression. The physiologic consequence of this is impaired diastolic filling, decreased cardiac output, leading to shock. So as the tamponade progresses, the filling pressures, uh, filling, uh, filling pressure become increasingly volume dependent and limited to inspiration. In other words, when the patient uh, ins uh, takes an inspiration, the, uh, the, 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 the increased right ventricular fill of filling causes the septum to bounce to the left, encroach on the left ventricle, thereby uh, accommodating more blood into the right, into the right uh, heart. However, at the, at the expense of reducing uh, cardiac output of the left ventricle. Dur uh, and the opposite occurs. When, when the patient uh, expires the air, the septum encroaches onto the right, uh, onto the right uh, side of the heart and uh, reducing uh, uh, blood entry into the right heart and uh, increasing a cardiac output on the left. This, this is the basis, this is basically what pulsus paradoxus means. Pulsus paradoxus is defined as uh, a reduction in systolic blood pressure of more than 10 millimeters of mercury on inspiration. Uh, it is important to, to note that this ventricular interdependence is present in normal physiological states. However, it is, it is exaggerated in a tamponade state, which is why it causes the pulsus paradoxes. So uh, usually patients with uh, acute tamponade present with uh, Beck's triad, uh, jugular venous distension, muffled heart sounds, and uh, reduced blood pressure. Uh, they may also be they may also be tachycardic, and they have a history which is consistent with rapid accumulation of fluid, such as uh, PCI, cardiac surgery, or uh, thoracic trauma. However, in patients who ha who are known to have chronic uh, pericardial effusions, usually when they present with tamponade, they may present with a normal or even an elevated systolic blood pressure. So echocardiography must be performed in order to uh, diagnose this condition. Uh, the left ventricular and diastolic volume is diminished. There is usually IVC plethora. Uh, this, is, uh, this here shows you the uh, a, a right atrial collapse and right ventricular collapse, which are both, uh, which, which indicates uh, tamponade. Uh, this pulse Doppler, uh, this is a mitral inflow, pulse Doppler wave, showing that during inspiration, the, uh, the velocity or the, uh, the inflow through the mitral valve is actually decreased, as we said before, because during inspiration, the septum will, uh, will shift towards the left, thereby reducing blood entry into the left ventricle. Uh, however, during expiration, as you can see, the inflow increases. The opposite occurs on the right side of the heart. The, uh, th the tricuspid valve, as you can see, during inspiration, there is an increased velocity, and during expiration, the velocity decreases. In most cases, the initial intervention is pericardiosynthesis. Uh, it, can be, uh, it, it, can, it can be done at bedside if the patient is uh, unable to be transported or the patient is hemodynamically unstable and there is no time. Uh, however, in cases where uh, the patients have history of surgery, uh, usually a, a surgical uh, uh, approach is, uh, is, is, is 
is preferred over a, a pericardial synthesis. So the pericardial synthesis, you have two approaches, either the sub-xiphoid sub area or the in, through the interfifth, the fifth intercostal space in the apical area. Uh, and usually they leave an, uh, an, an, uh, an indwelling catheter so that the fluid will not reaccumulate. So a pericardial window can be uh, usually is indicated for cardiac tamponade caused by traumatic uh, hemopericardium. Uh, it may be performed through a sub incision, an anterior thoracotomy, or through a thoracoscopy. Uh, Post-operative tamponade is a subset of pericardial tamponade and usually occurs uh, the incidence uh, is between 0.1 to 6%. Uh, it is uh, usually regional uh, due to, uh, uh, because cl clot formation would, will lead to loculation of the hemopericardium. The approach is, uh, is guided by timing. So for example, an early tamponade that happens immediately post in the post-operative period, usually the patient will have to be sent back to the OR or uh, to, to, be re uh, to re do re-exploration of the chest. Uh, a late uh, effusion or late tamponade post-operatively can in some cases be treated with the pericardial synthesis. However, surgery is usually uh, the preferred method. Now, moving on to pericarditis. Pericarditis is inflammation of the uh, inflammation of the pericardial sac, and it can happen with or without effusion, and it may be caused by either infectious or non-infectious causes. Uh, it is usually uh, classified into either acute, recurrent, incessant, or chronic. Acute, uh, recurrent pericarditis is a uh, in, 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 is usually when a patient has acute pericarditis and then has a, a period of four to six weeks of remission and then the symptoms recur. Incessant pericarditis is when the patient has symptoms for more than four to six weeks and, and chronic pericarditis is usually uh, classified after a patient has has been having symptoms for more than three months. Uh, this table lists the, the causes of acute pericarditis. The most common cause is idiopathic. Usually, uh, most cases are attributed to viral uh, uh, cause. However, there are some specific causes, some neoplasms cause, some, some carcinomas, some uh, uh, angiosarcomas. They may cause uh, pericardial effusion. Uh, TB can cause pericardial effusion and, per and pericardial constriction. And uh, as we said, rheumatoid arthritis, uh, thyroid, uh, and uh, thyroid disorders, SLE, they all can cause peri uh, uh, pericarditis. Usually patients with acute pericarditis present with a sharp retrosternal chest pain. Uh, they may report that it improves on sitting or leaning forward. Uh, they may have a low-grade intermittent fever, and there is usually a pericardial friction, a friction rub. The, this is from the uh, European uh, uh, site of cardiology guidelines. So in order to diagnose acute pericarditis, at least two of the following criteria have to be present. Uh, there must be pericarditic chest pain, pericardial rub, a new widespread ST elevation or RR depression on ECG, or a pericardial effusion. Additional supporting findings include uh, elevation of cardiac markers such as CRP, ESR, or white blood cells. Uh, there, might, there might be evidence of inflammation by uh, imaging techniques such as CT or cardiac MRI. So, all pa uh, uh, patients, all patients are recommended to have an ECG, uh, an echo, a chest X-ray, and uh, assessment of uh, inflammatory markers. So this here is an ECG of a patient with uh, pericarditis. As you can see, there is PR depression and diffuse ST elevation all over. That indicates that the patient has is having acute pericarditis. Usually, uh, the uh, 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 ECG of a patient with pericarditis begins with, uh, uh, has four stages. Stage one is ST elevation, stage two is pseudo normalization, and stage three is actually T wave inversion, and then stage four is normalization of the ECG. This can happen over a course of weeks to months. Uh, so, this algorithm uh, uh, is, is uh, suggested for treatment of patients with suspected acute uh, pericarditis. So, if a specific etiology is not suspected, uh, we, are, we are saying that this patient is having an, uh, an idiopathic pericarditis, then we can start empiric therapy with uh, NSAIDs. If the patient is not a high risk, then he can be discharged uh, and followed uh, in the outpatient uh, setup. If the patient is deemed to be high risk, moderate risk, the patient has to be admitted and an, et an, etiology, should, an, an etiology of pericarditis should be, should be searched. Uh, high risk cases. Uh, if if the uh, if if the patient uh, 
High risk cases are usually because of uh, these predictors of poor prognosis. They include, they have major and minor criteria. They include the fever, more than 38 degrees Celsius, a subacute onset, a large pericardial effusion, cardiac tamponade, a lack of response to aspirin in a patient with, who's already diagnosed with uh, uh, acute pericarditis after at least one week of therapy. Minor uh, criteria include myopericarditis, which is uh, simply pericarditis plus and elevated cardiac enzymes, either CKMB or troponin, if the patient has history of immunosuppression or a patient has history of trauma or is using uh, oral anticoagulation therapy. So the recommended regimen for a uh, patient with acute pericarditis uh, usually is ibuprofen and colchicine. Uh, aspirin can also be used. Uh, ibuprofen usually 600 milligrams Q8 for uh, one to two weeks. The co colchicine is usually 0 0.5 milligrams if the patient weighs less than 70 kilograms. If the patient weighs more than 70 kilograms, then we have to start the patient on 0 0.5 uh, twice daily uh, for three months. And uh, multiple studies have shown that uh, ibuprofen plus colchicine is better than ibuprofen or aspirin alone. Uh, it is important to note that usually corticosteroid is not, uh, corticosteroids are not uh, considered to be first line medications and should not be used as first line medications unless there is a clear contraindication for use of non, uh, non steroidal inflammatory agents. Uh, and if they are going to be used, they should be added to, uh, to NSAIDs plus colchicine. They should not be used as uh, the sole agent. Uh, and uh, usually in, in cases or with the recurrent pericarditis when you can uh, start with the low dose corticosteroids. Uh, if the uh, if uh, in, in patients who, who have recurrent pericarditis and do not who do not respond to NSAIDs and uh, exercise restriction, they can be tried with uh, corticosteroids. If that doesn't work, we can always start the patient on IV aminoglobulin or azathioprine. If that doesn't work and the patient is still symptomatic, then the final uh, uh, solution could be uh, a pericardiectomy. So a subset of pericarditis is constrictive pericarditis, and which is a disorder of impaired cardiac filling caused by an inelastic pericardium that restricts cardiac chamber expansion to a fixed volume. Uh, chronic inflammation of the pericardium will lead to fibrous stiffening, which will result in hemodynamic changes, uh, particularly, as I said, impairment of diastolic filling, which is the hallmark of constrictive uh, pericarditis. So constricting can result from any cause of acute pericarditis, and idiopathic, via, uh, bacterial, uh, and after cardiac surgery or post-myocardial infarction symptoms such as uh, Dressler syndrome. All of these causes can cause constrictive pericarditis. Usually, patients with constrictive pericarditis present with signs and symptoms, signs and symptoms of heart failure, including dizzy on exertion, uh, increased venous pressure, and edema. Uh, there is usually a paradoxical increase in jugular venous uh, pressure on inspiration, uh, which is known as a uh, Kutmouth sign. Uh, the, 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 the pericardial uh, constriction uh, usually exerts its uh, pathophysiological effects by limiting cardiac filling. Uh, however, unlike tamponade, with which uh, in, in tamponade, the filling is limited from the onset of diastole because the intrapericardial pressure is very high. Uh, in pericardial constriction, however, the, the, the limitation of diastolic filling is in the late diastolic phase because the, in, early diastole, in the early diastole, the, the, the heart is filling normally. However, when it reaches a certain uh, volume, the heart cannot expand any further because it, 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 it meets with an inelastic and stiff pericardium. And, that, uh, uh, and, and that's why uh, there, there is usually small volume on echocardiogram in patients with constrictive pericarditis. So the, uh, the free walls are immobilized, which leaves the ventricular septum as the last seedling structure, and it is displaced. As, as what happens in pericardial tamponade, the, uh, there is usually uh, interventricular dependence uh, between the left and right ventricle. So uh, echocardiography findings include pericardial thickening, uh, uh, caval plethora, and small chamber volumes. CT is the preferred technique to identify pericardial calcification and can help identify uh, the distribution and severity of pericardial thickening and spatial relationship in preoperative planning. Uh, in presence of a diastolic septal bounce in cardiac MRI has been found to have has been had to, to be 96% sensitive and 100% specific for constrictive 
pericarditis. Here is a CT scan and, and the, the top picture you can see there is pericardial thickening. And the second picture, the, uh, the CT shows evidence of pericardial calcification. Uh, this here shows the ventricular interdependence uh, between the, uh, the right ventricle and the left ventricle. And uh, during early inspiration, as you can see, the, the, the septum actually bulges towards the left side of the heart. During the early exp uh, expiration, the opposite happens. The septum will uh, encroach onto the, uh, the right ventricle. Uh, as we said, there is pericardial thickening in MRI, and there is also altered uh, geometry of the cardiac chambers that can all lead to uh, uh, helping you diagnose the patient as having constrictive pericarditis. Uh, here you can see uh, three different patients. The first patient does not have, has a normal pericardium, does not have pericarditis. Uh, there is, a, the, uh, as we said, the, uh, this is a normal pericardium. And in the second row here, you can see there is evidence of hyper uh, intense uh, signal uh, and delayed hyper, enhan delayed hyper enhancement uh, or delayed enhancement, which uh, leads to think that this patient is having a, a, an active or acute pericarditis. And, and this last row shows a patient with chronic pericarditis. As you can see in the first picture, there is a pericardial thickening. However, in the second and third, uh, third picture, there is no hyper intense signal and there is no delayed enhancement. Uh, another method that can be used to identify uh, a uh, constrictive pericarditis is doing uh, simultaneous right and left uh, left heart catheterization. And, uh, and this one, and, and this uh, here, you can see that there is equalization of pressure between the right and the left ventricle, and there is what is known as the square root sign. And that can lead you to think that this patient is actually having a constrictive pericarditis. It is important to understand this because. Uh, sometimes there are some conditions that may mimic uh, constrictive pericarditis, most importantly, uh, restrictive cardiomyopathy, which is a, uh, also a, 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 a disease of uh, impaired filling. However, it is a, uh, it, it is a, diastolic, a diastolic function, uh, dysfunction, which leads to impaired filling. Uh, However, there are some differences, and there are some uh, some signs and symptoms which uh, clinician can use to guide him or her to differentiate between these two conditions. For example, pulses paradoxes usually uh, can be uh, present in uh, patients with uh, pericardial constriction. However, it is usually absent in, in restrictive cardiomyopathy. A, uh, the, the square root sign is usually present in pericardial constriction, and in restrict restrictive cardiomyopathy, it may not always be present. Uh, usually, the septal bounce is uh, an, an echocardiography is present in constriction. It is not present in restrictive cardiomyopathy. And pericardial thickening is usually increased uh, in pericardial constriction. However, in restrictive cardiomyopathy, it is a, uh, it is not it is not present. It is important also to note that restrictive cardiomyopathy is a medical disease. There is no surgical cure. However, a pericard pericardial constriction ultimately is going to, uh, patients ultimately going to need surgery. So it is important to distinguish between these two conditions when, when, when a patient presents. So uh, a treatment of constrictive uh, pericarditis, usually the underlying disease has to be treated first, whether it's uh, TB, uh, hypothyroidism or tuberculosis, the, the underlying condition must be first treated. Uh, and patients with pericardial inflammation must receive uh, anti-inflammatory uh, uh, drugs. Uh, if, if, uh, if there is any uh, response to therapy, it will show as resolution of, uh, a resolution of symptoms, reversion of uh, constrictive pathology, uh, on echo and uh, and evidence by MRI. If there is no uh, response to therapy, then surgery is the final uh, solution. And uh, with surgery, you can either do an anterior uh, pericardiectomy in which you uh, resect between the two phrenic nerves, from phrenic nerve to phrenic nerve, or a complete uh, pericardiectomy, which is anterior pericardiectomy plus uh, resection of the diaphragmatic surface of the pericardium. And finally, you can do a radical uh, pericardiectomy, which is a complete pericardiectomy plus posterior to the left phrenic nerve. Now, uh, in some patients, uh, the, the constriction uh, and thickening, uh, uh, there is constriction and thickening of the, uh, of the pericardium and conventional pericardiectomy may not resolve the, the problem. 
So if pericardiectomy does not result in, in, in prompt hemodynamic improvements in these patients, then a waffle procedure can be performed. Uh, it usually involves uh, intersecting incisions of one centimeter in, uh, in length, and these intersecting incisions are thought to the to d decrease uh, uh, increase the sorry de de decrease the area of uh, thickened pericardium and leads to resolution of symptoms. Not a lot of data has been uh, published uh, around this procedure, but uh, uh, the early results are encouraging. Uh, finally, we'll talk about postcardiac injury syndromes, which is an umbrella term uh, used to describe uh, inflammatory pericardial syndromes after. Uh, 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 after after uh, pericardial injury, and they include post myocardial infarction, pericarditis, post pericardiectomy syndrome, and post traumatic pericarditis. They are thought to be to, to have an autoimmune pathogenesis, which is triggered by initial damage to uh, pericardium and pleural tissue caused by either myocardial necrosis, such as in Dressler syndrome, surgical trauma, or accidental uh, thoracic trauma. Uh, the diagnosis of post uh, cardiac injury syndrome. Uh, has to fulfill the following criteria. The patient usually presents with fever without an alternative cause, pericardiotic or pleuritic chest pain. There is usually a pericardial or pleural rub, and there is evidence of pericardial effusion, uh, or there is a pleural effusion with an elevated CRP. Um, Dressler syndrome, which occurs uh, usually two to 10 weeks after an uh, MI, is treated uh, the same as an acute pericarditis, with uh, uh, usually with an aspirin. Uh, uh, yes, and the other uh, the other uh, conditions such as post pericardiectomy syndrome and uh, post traumatic pericarditis are also treated with uh, non steroidal anti inflammatory agents. Uh, these are my references, and uh, thank you very much. And if you have any questions, thank you, Dr. Sultan. Uh, we will have a um, five minutes break and we'll proceed to the next lecture.
our next uh, lecture is going to be about total pericardiotomy by Dr. Afnan Malki. Dr. Afnan, you can share your screen. Okay. Um, can you see my slides now? Yes, we can see you. Okay. Um, okay, so uh, thank you, Ahmed. And um, I'd like to say thank you, Sultan, because you covered most of my slides. It's already a short topic, but... Um, this is Nana Malki, cardiac surgery resident from King Abdullah Medical City in Mecca, and I'll be talking about uh, pericardiectomy, surgical techniques, and surgical outcome. Uh, this session is moderated by uh, Dr. Ala Azhari, cardiac surgeon from King Abdullah Medical City and an ECMO chairman. I think he'll be joining us very soon. So uh, the objectives were anatomy, surgical indication and guidelines, type of pericardiectomy and surgical techniques, as well as surgical outcomes following pericardiectomy. I'm gonna skip through the repetitive slides and talk about, uh, yeah, the slide here. So uh, previously, uh, Sultan mentioned that the fourth line of uh, treating uh, acute pericarditis would be pericardiectomy. Another school would say that it depends mainly on the time frame of the um, disease itself. So if it's a transient constrictive pericarditis, you're going to give the patient a trial of medical therapy. If, however, it failed, then you're going to consider surgical pericardiectomy, knowing that the um, operative mortality is more than 6%. Uh, the European Society of uh, Cardiology gave a class 1C to pericardiectomy in case of chronic permanent constrictive pericarditis. And um, I'd like to take some time here talking about um, when do we decide to take this patient for surgery or not. Uh, so uh, if we have a patient who has um, NYHA class of one or two, and those patients believe to be clinically stable for years, um, you don't want to subject those patients to the high risk of the surgery. On the other hand, if we have patients who have pericardial diseases with an NYHA class of four, they have uh, depressed, depressed uh, left ventricular uh, function as well as an advanced fibrosis and calcification, those patients are already labeled as high risk and high mortality. Therefore, you don't want to subject them to the, um, to the surgery and adding an insult. So at the end of the day, it comes to your own clinical judgment and based on the risk benefit analysis. Uh, we have a multiple controversies when it comes to the management of pericarditis. One of them is the timing of the surgery. Uh, some believe that if the patient is newly diagnosed with constrictive pericarditis, those patients uh, happen to be hemodynamically stable. You wanna give them a trial of two to three months on conservative management before pericardiectomy is recommended. Some say if the patients are uh, newly diagnosed, however, they're hemodynamically unstable, then pericardiectomy is indicated. And uh, types of pericardiectomy, as already been mentioned before, we have partial, total, radical, and the Wappler procedure. So for the partial pericardiectomy, it's not an intended procedure. It's known as an um, incomplete decortication of one or both the ventricles because of um, severe uh, pericardial adhesion. Total pericardiectomy is a wide um, excision of the pericardium with a landmark of the phrenic nerves, posteriorly, the great vessels, and the intrapericardial portion of the superior vena cava along with the right atrial junction superiorly. And then we have the diaphragm, the inferior vena cava, and the right, uh, the, sorry, the right atrial junction inferiorly. I ran across a paper that uh, was published back in um, early 2005, where it compared total pericardiectomy to partial pericardiectomy. And um, the conclusion was that total pericardiectomy was associated with lower perioperative and late mortality, uh, and it showed significant long-term advantages in comparison to partial pericardiectomy. 
The other two types, we have radical resection, which is known as um, phrenic nerve to phrenic nerve. Uh, so it's basically the removal of the pericardium, including the anterior lateral on the diaphragmatic surface of the left and the right ventricle, careful dissection um, around the, post the posterior portion of the uh, phrenic nerve, leaving it as an intact pedicle. The waffle procedure involves uh, making multiple uh, longitudinal and transverse incision into the thickened myocardium to make it more dispensable. Another paper was published in um, 2018, I believe, where it um, compared the radical pericardiectomy to subtotal pericardiectomy in cases of chronic constrictive pericarditis. Again, the radical pericardiectomy had the upper hand providing um, superior 10 years survival and clinical function improvement comparing to total pericardiectomy. Um, our surgical approach can be median sternotomy, bilateral thoracotomy, or anterior lateral thoracotomy. The median sternotomy provides the widest, the largest um, view of the heart and its related structures. Bilateral thoracotomy can be used in cases of reduced surgeries or in case of the initial um, approach was anterior lateral thoracotomy. However, the exposure was insufficient. Um, the downside of bilateral thoracotomy is that it carries more risk for respiratory problems after the surgery. Uh, the last approach would be anterior lateral thoracotomy. Um, it provides good access to the posterior portion of the pericardium. However, when it comes to viewing the right side of the heart, it's not um, as good. And um, in case of intracardiac repair, uh, once the pericardium is injured, this is not the preferred approach. Another controversy part is the um, cardiopulmonary bypass. Uh, some of the surgeons, they have, um, I would say, low threshold to use cardiopulmonary bypass because of the complication of the bypass itself. However, uh, it can be very useful in cases of extreme blood loss, large calcification, or in case of there is an accidental damage to the heart during the surgery. So um, the technique, uh, first of all, if you plan on doing your surgery with cardiopulmonary bypass, you may want to decorticate the areas where you want to place your cannulation at, followed by um, midline um, incision of the pericardium. You may want to look for um, a place that has um, um, fat pad that makes it easier to dissect normally um, near the diaphragm towards the right side. Um, traditionally, what happens is that we'd like to decorticate the left side first or the left ventricle first uh, to prevent pulmonary edema. However, um, in this pictures and in the video uh, will be shown later, they decided to go with decorticating the right side first. Um, their justification was um, it's the most interior structure you encounter as you do sternotomy. And some believe that um, to decorticate the left side first, it's a little bit challenging. But uh, anyways, the idea is the same. Um, uh, you're gonna dissect um, the pericardium and move as laterally as possible, keeping one centimeter away from the right phrenic nerve. And in the same scenario, when it comes to the left side. Um, one thing I'd like to mention is that the pericardium has to be retracted for better visualization of the nearby structures that are at risk of injury. Like at this uh, picture, which structure is most likely to be injured? And that is a question. Anyone? Okay, so it will be the LID. So uh, do whatever you wanna do to retract the pericardium far away from the heart. You can use your cochlea, you can use alice, you can use retractile sutures and uh, stay one centimeter away from the left phrenic. And this is how it looks like. Remember, if you don't visualize uh, the most important structures at risk, that means you're not in the right plane for decortication. Um, and then the dissection continues uh, to free the inferior pericardium from the diaphragm. Again, um, the dilated um, inferior vena cava here is at a risk of injury too. So risk or uh, um, precaution should be uh, taken in this area. And this is how it looks like after it's being freed. So this is a fast forward video of uh, pericardiectomy done through median sternotomy. Hmm. 
midline incision followed by freeing the pleura for better visualization of the phrenic nerves bilaterally. Again, the surgeon decided to go with the right side first. And in the video, you can hear his um, justification. Uh, stay sutures were used to attract the pericardium far away from the heart. Uh, whichever method you decide to choose to protect the heart, it could be using your assistant hand to push the heart far away from the pericardium. You can use a gauze or a sponge um, as long as you keep the underlying structure protected. And shortly, he'll move on to the uh, left side. In the same manner with protection of the LED. And then the heart is being pushed away from the diaphragm and see shortly and freed inferiorly. Okay, so the outcomes and the cause of death, um, the operative mortality rate strongly relates to the perioperative NYHA classes. Uh, higher mortality rates are associated with pericardiectomy post-radiation. Post-cardiectomy card, um, constrictive pericarditis accounts for 8.3% of the cases. Myocardial atrophy after prolonged constriction or residual constriction or because of concomitant myocardial process can lead to prolonged cardiac failure, even though uh, the patient underwent successful pericardiectomy. The causes of death reviewed in the literature were um, multi-organ failure, cardiac failure, and respiratory insufficiency. Uh, these are my references and a special thanks to Dr. Uh, Iham. Uh, to take a home message, uh, pericardiectomy is indicated once the diagnosis of constricted pericarditis is made. Um, early intervention in patients with favorable function status is recommended for an early and a late survival and um, uh, functional outcomes. Um, thank you, and I hope if you have any questions, me and Dr. Ayla are happy to help. Thank you, Dr. Rafnan. Uh, if there is no questions, we'll conclude our uh, academic day today.